Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, start by thanking you for inviting me to this uh, session. And I'm going to share, I have, I have some three slides. Um, oh, I have some three slides and I would like to share uh, my slides so that at least uh, they can um, be seen because there are three, so it means that I'm going to move with speed in terms of what I'm going to make a presentation on. And um, I hope you can, can you manage to see the screens, please? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. I want to make sure that they are all. Very good. I, I think I was told to talk about um, this um, fintech revolution. And uh, because it's, um, I, I, I like the subject matter is because of where I'm coming from. I thought maybe the first thing I do is that um, I'll talk about what, where is fintechs? Where, where, in the last 20 years, what's, what has happened to the fintechs? And the second thing is that what kind of results are we seeing fintechs driving in the market? And the final point is that coming from being a regulator, I also find you know, maybe I have to talk about the issue of do we need to regulate fintechs because there's a lot of literature and debate about for regulating fintechs. But first of all, let me tell you, I work for the African Economic Research Consortium. Our approach to capacity building and knowledge generation is very, very critical. I have to share this right so that I don't lose my job, but the, that's very, very important. But then we come to the main issues. In the last 20 years, what have we seen? We have seen that the fintechs have changed the way banking services are provided, and especially in the African economies where the informality of markets is such that it's so difficult for you to access the banking services. The way banks work has also changed because all of a sudden the banks realize that they have technological platforms they can use. And I'm very happy because all this related to like the investor developments and Nick will perhaps talk about it being one of the um, develop, one of the main originators of MPES. And secondly, even in terms of the applications he has done. And also we have seen even how capital is raised has changed. And even our knowledge of money and its form has changed. Like everybody was astounded when MPES started using electronics, electronic units of money and using it in, to transact. And everybody thought that it was a new institution uh, issuing money in Kenya, other than the central bank. And they, it's because we didn't have knowledge in terms of how different forms of money can work, yet there was still fiat organized or issued by one uh, institution called the central bank. And so we have seen the rise of mobile money or what people would like to call electronic units of money. And the second thing that has become very important is that most of these fintechs have actually originated from a regulatory, a regulatory sandbox. And this allowed regulators to support fintechs in terms of product development. And M-Pesa is an important case in point, even though when M-Pesa M -Pesa was starting, nobody talked about regulatory sandbox. It is because of its success, everybody started saying, how did you nurture it? How did the, the, the originators or even the developers originated, how did the regulators deal with it? And we have seen the first impact was to revolutionize how retail electronic payments and even digital financial services was working. And for us, that's a very, very major contribution in terms of this area. The second, the second uh, point I wanted to make is what are the outcomes? It's a success story, all right, but what are the outcomes? I want to give four outcomes here. One of them, is the electronic, the, the retail, and uh, retail electronic payments platform evolved. The most important that it, the, point, the most important point, and you see, see the area literature was that it was being described as effective, efficient, transparent, and safe. But for us, especially coming from the African region, it's a very easier entry into financial services. And more importantly, because we have so many informal markets in Africa, it was an indirect way of informal, uh, formalizing informal markets. But the most important point I want to make here is that once you have a successful electronic payment system or even platform, it becomes a game changer. And fintechs can roll out new products that will affect across uh, all sectors of the economy. And we're going to see examples. The second thing is that financial inclusion was always something that was had evaded the African continent because banks were in cities. Banks were in major towns. You have, you have to, to get there. 
But it is because the banking sector itself had not realized that they can use such a platform to actually develop aspects of financial inclusion. So we have seen that financial inclusion has been a success and there's evidence now of financial development, but more importantly, inclusive, inclusive finance and poverty reduction. Banks recognize that they have a technological platform to manage to, to use so that they can manage micro accounts. You don't have to visit a bank. You can actually transact in your comfort, in your home comfort. They would reach customers cost effectively. It has also, especially for me coming from the central bank as a regulator, it allowed me, and I argued this very strongly when I was defending Kenya when it was in the dark gray list by FTF, that it is going to improve the AML CFT regime because electronic payments are monitored and financial transactions can be, uh, can be monitored so they can improve the AML CFT regime. But more importantly, it is inclusive finance that is going to be important for us. And we have seen cases where women can save in instruments that cannot be encroached. They are efficient savers. And this, these are very, very important outcomes from a developmental or even inclusive uh, growth point of view. Governor, I'm sorry, can I, can I interrupt you just, I don't know if you want to advance your slides at, at all while you're going I, through. I, I, would, I have moved, I haven't moved them. Okay, let me mention this last point and then I'll move the, the slides. Yeah? Perfect, thank you. They are not moving? Okay, uh, I, I found, are they moving? No. Okay, okay, uh, let's see how I can then move. Uh, move them. What about now? Nope, I think we're still on your home slide. Oh, okay, then there must be some problem in the, I tested this and it was working. What about now? No, unfortunately, they seem. Uh, okay, let me finish then I'll share the slides. Okay, yeah. let me press on. And I, I tested it and then I saw them moving. But <laughs> you want me to start over again? Let me see. Let me, uh, let me say that fintechs have brought down sustainable business models and we have examples. For example, the one acre fund that has raised productivity of incomes from smallholders. M Corp on domestic solar energy has really become a very important source of uh, uh, writing and, 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 and even energy supply in countries where this is quite a constraint or cities where this is a constraint. Water bedding machines in urban slums, crop insurance models. Those, those are very, very important, including virtual health insurance models. So there are so many as, uh, uh, products that are coming in, including Emma Kiba, which you can invest in government securities using your mobile phone. But the final one, and more important, is that we are revolutionizing e-government services, electronic government services, <coughs> tax policy designs, tax payment platforms, and even revenue administration. For me, the design of efficient social protection program, especially during the COVID, is really a game changer showing how fintechs have really improved the, 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 the situation for us. Uh, but finally, let me ask the question, have uh, fintechs created any regulatory upheaval? And uh, I think there are so many concerns whenever you turn and you find out that uh, perhaps there is a major problem that we don't seem to realize. But when you look at it more deeply, then you realize that we, we, we don't seem to know where there are areas of concern that require fintech regulation. For example, in the financial system regulation, fintechs have not affected prudential safeguards or even consumer protection or market integrity. So there are no, the, 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 the aspects of licensing digital banks is, is actually just the normal regulatory requirement. The most active areas where we are seeing fintechs being or even an idea of regulation is how to develop innovation hubs, regulatory sandboxes and accelerators. But so far, the only area that I've seen in the literature that requires concern is actually consumer data, consumer and data protect, protection, which for me is an, an operational resilience. And the most important uh, uh, aspect of these regulations or, or discussions in these regulations is actually to minimize regulatory arbitrage because fintechs will be regulated, regulated by different uh, uh, regulators and how do they come together? For me, the final point I would make here is that it's an argument of prudence that is required. We would like to make sure that we don't discourage, you know, dis discourage innovation and even investment in this, this area. We want to promote financial stability and market integrity. So what kind of actions do we take to combat, to combat any emerging risk 
as soon as they are recognized is going to be very, very important. And also create an element of coordination and cooperation across regulators. And that way we can actually gain the advantages of what we are seeing the FinTech revolution coming into the market across all sectors of the economy. And we are sure to make uh, uh, a, a very good case in the future. It's left for me to say in uh, our language, Asante Sana, that is, uh, thank you very much for Swa in Swahili. And then I will discover why the slides didn't move. That's it, my bad there. Thank you so much. Well, even, even I'll, without- I'll, I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll share the slides. I'm sorry about this because when I tested it worked very well. Now I'm not uh, so sure. Me, well, it'd be great. Yeah, maybe we can share them with the audience uh, later, but thank you. Those remarks were very helpful in, in kicking us off. Uh, with that, we'll move to the, the next presentation, uh, Nick Hughes. Great, thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, it's always good to follow the governor of the central bank. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking the other day, M-Pesa is now 14 years old. So it's, uh, it's a little bit like a teenager. It's quite big. You know, it's, it's doing lots of things. It's very active, but um, it's still a relatively young thing. And I, I know we still talk about it a lot in, you know, in an African fintech context, um, um, but it's, you know, it's obviously very successful in one country, but I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about a framework for how I can see fintech applying uh, more broadly and, and how I think the technology is starting to allow us to explore new business models around fintech, not, not just strictly payment services. Um, so I'll talk about that for a few minutes and then I'll, I'll sort of end with a little bit of research that we're doing at London Business School around scale, because scale is quite an important issue here. We sort of hold on to scale all the time and then PESA, of course, you know, by whatever measure you take has scaled very well, but, but um, there's some data starting to emerge that hitting scale is actually quite hard. And I'd like to touch on, on that if I can at the end of my presentation. Uh, so let me see if I can share my slides. And um, I hope, uh, can you, uh, perhaps somebody could confirm if they can see my slides? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can you see them? Very good. Thank you. Uh, I'll try that. Let's see if I can get off the first slide. <laughs> and see if it moves. I only have two to share, actually. Um, this first one is a very simple framework uh, that I use when, when I'm talking about mobile payments and where I believe innovation is starting to happen. Uh, and basically, I, I believe there are two very powerful levers that we've got now that we can use. The first, of course, is the GSM infrastructure. Now, now globally, 93% of the world's population are now under a mobile network somewhere. I mean, and that could be a two and a half G network. It might be a sort of a four G network or an LTE network, way where we're starting to see, um, you know, great improvements in what we can do on those networks. And this this infrastructure layer is is very powerful, I think. Um, and you can couple that with the fact that smartphones are now relatively cheap. I mean, you can get a smartphone in many parts of Africa now for under forty dollars. And so you've got an amazing device in your hand and a good quality network. And there are perhaps some issues around the cost of data and, and usage of that network. But generally, we have this fantastic infrastructure layer that we can use now when we think about designing new products. And on top of it, of course, payments, the ability, because of the, the regulators having moved this way, we can now move small amounts of money between accounts uh, at a pretty low cost and obviously over great distances. And that payments layer, which M-Pesa started you know, in 2007 when we launched it, has actually evolved into something much more now. You Individuals can move money between people, you can pay your bills, you can, businesses can do bulk payments or disbursements. And so that itself has evolved uh, quite a long way. But for me, the most exciting part is around the, the services we can build using those two layers. And, and, and M-Copa is a good example. So at M-Copa, uh, we, we provide clean energy services to people who are off grid. And so you start, you know, hang on a minute, what, what does energy services got to do with payments? But actually the business model that MCOPA has adopted and many others now in this space has been made possible because of those first two layers. First of all, we can connect 
to the solar equipment. So that's a solar panel and a battery and a TV and a radio and lights. We can connect it and see it remotely because of the infrastructure layer. And because I can collect a small payment, I can turn it on and turn it off and I can allow the customer to buy it in small payments. And so I'm financing a consumer or a household or a small business when they're financing their way into clean energy. Um, and then Copa's now got over a million customers in, in East Africa. But for me, that's just one example of where I, I, I think digital payments need to go. We need to think about the opportunities to change the business models in, in other services, so adjacent sectors, services and agriculture. And, and the governor mentioned a couple of other um, great examples of, of using digital payments in, in the ag sector space. Um, so for me, this is very exciting. You know, I, th I think we're going to see more and more innovation around embedded financial services, utilizing those two big levers of infrastructure and digital payments. So that, that's the sort of high level uh, position. I'd, I'd like to show you my next slide, which is sort of brings, brings it back to earth a little bit uh, with a bump, um, because it's actually quite hard to make things scale. And so we've been doing a little bit of work at London Business School with the Wheeler Institute for business and development with some FCDO support, so some government, uh, UK government support. Um, and we've poured over the data of around 700 fintech companies trying to look very hard for good evidence of scale. And, and it's actually a harder thing to do than you might think at the outset, because first of all, fintech isn't one thing. Um, and many people listening to this will know that, you know, you, you can't take a look at fintech without and do any sort of decent analysis without breaking it into the different elements of fintech. So you've obviously got infrastructure plays, you've got payment services, you've got um, small uh, sort of crypto type applications which get bundled in with, with fintech as well. So the first thing to do is to understand what do we actually mean by fintech and then disaggregate data down at a firm level, down into those different types of, of, of companies offering different types of fintech services. And then you, you start to bump up, well, what do you mean by scale? Um, is it the number of customers or users? Is it the revenue? Is it the number of employees? And so we, we've, uh, uh, looking at these data, we, we applied a very simple index rule across four character, characteristics of, of scale, uh, which is shown on the slide there. So certainly number of users, that's probably the most common one. But we also tried very hard to get good data on revenues, the amount of fundraising that a company has done, and the number of employees working in that organization. And that allowed us to create an index and we could move an index towards a score. And what we're, what we're finding is actually only around 8% of the companies of the 700 fintechs that we looked at have, have reached scale if we use that, that cumulative index score that, we, that, I, that you can see there on the slide. And that's actually a little bit lower than we might all think. When we think of fintech in Africa, we think um, fast moving, nascent sector, fast growing, lots of opportunity because of all the infrastructure problems we see in many parts of Africa. And so we'd expect, I think, we'd expect to see more scale than we actually can when we, when we get deep into the data. You know, and then, and then I'm reminded of my own lessons, you know, as, as we got M-Pesa going, as we, as we grew in Copa, it's actually very hard operationally to, to hit scale. And there are a number of reasons why, but I'll, I'll just share a few and, and perhaps we can come back to this in the discussion. First of all, Africa isn't one place, of course it's not. It's hugely fragmented. And back to the governor's point, we need to see more coordination across the regulators to allow us business uh, practitioners to play by a common set of rules and know how to invest and where to invest with some regulatory certainty around some key points uh, behind running a, a fintech business. Um, secondly, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there's still a need for a cash to e-money interface. That's really important. And it's often forgotten about when we talk about FinTech. We, we, we imagine everything is gonna be purely electronic and we're gonna be able to move, the, move information and value around without the need to turn it back into cash. Actually, that's very hard to do. And in many parts of Africa, we still need to think about how we get cash into electronic systems and electronic value back into cash. And that inevitably takes you towards the need for agent networks. And agent networks are, are, are complex and they're big and they're quite expensive to run. And so that's, you know, my, my second point is, 
where we've actually still got to keep our feet on the ground and remember we still live in largely in a cash economy in many parts of Africa. So, um, so I'll wrap it up there really. I mean, the first, I, I hope you gave, I gave you my view of a framework, which I'm very excited about. And I'm, I am an optimist around the potential for FinTech in Africa, uh, as you'd expect. But, but equally, on the other side of that coin, we've got to remember it's not as easy uh, as we think. It's actually pretty hard to make this stuff reach scale. Um, and I, oh, I look forward to uh, any questions on this presentation and, and the discussion with the other panelists uh, coming up soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. That was wonderful. OK, next up, uh, we have Viola Llewellyn for her presentation. Hello, everybody. Let me just get myself set up here really quickly. OK. Have I got it correctly? Yep, looks good. Thank you. Good day to everybody. I'm so excited to be here with the University of Michigan and all of these great panelists. My name is Viola Llewellyn and I'm the co-founder and president of Avanva Solutions Inc, which is a trade tech solution that innovates for banks, central banks, SMEs, and those that wish to serve uh, Africa's SMEs and those in the informal space. And I'm going to be talking to you about the context of, uh, for, of fintech in Africa from the context of trade. Ovamba's always sat in a very strange place that I think helps to make meaning of what are we doing with all of these wonderful uh, fintech payment solutions and how does that impact us as a continent? We are involved and are always concerned with better ways in which to build risk models to understand SMEs and the informal sector within the African cultural context of trade. And for us, uh, FinTech is really about opening up the door and making sure that every individual on our continent who wishes to engage either domestically or internationally has the underpinnings of an ecosystem that will support growth, wealth, and a clear understanding of who we are as people and as part of a larger uh, global community. By having products and systems and solutions and innovations that drive visibility, we can start to understand what exactly is needed for every individual or every business owner who wishes to develop transferable wealth. Before this point, it was very difficult to see exactly what is happening in the far reaches of any economy, especially those who are informal, especially those who haven't had the ability to gain access to digital currencies. Now, East Africa has been brilliant at driving that, but in the Francophone zone, that's a little bit different and doesn't look or even feel the same. We're in a very early part of developing the policies and the regulatory environment that will allow that great explosion that we are all expecting. Now, because of FinTech, the words and the language around Africa is open for business, we can kind of put that away. FinTech connects our old selves to our future selves as digital citizens who are involved in the movement of cash and services. Our old self as Africans, we traded, we created a lot of transferable wealth. And now we've come full circle where we can finally say, FinTech is how we answer the questions of what are we buying? Where are we buying it from? How is that information being moved up into the policy area to make decisions and support FinTech innovators as we impact the ecosystem? We've got to be able to continue answering some really simple questions. Um, when we ask the question about where is the cash, we're really talking about traceability, trackability, innovators who are helping us to understand what, not just what happened, but what is supposed to happen, using AI to model outcomes so that policymakers can help support a healthy economy. Understanding why it is that one cultural group is better or different or operates um, with success in a different way. 
for us, um, using trade to understand that is a great way to support the, the economy, a great way to support Africa in the dawn of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is going to turn our continent into the biggest trade zone in the world. Without fintech solutions that have entrenched themselves before this point, we would be doing what Africa is always known for, waiting to leapfrog. Now, the context with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement means that we can lead. Providing options to access to capital means that we're supporting that whole democracy of access to capital, which is the same as the democracy of deciding how successful an individual wants to be. It's not for us easy to talk about fintech without understanding the human journey in this. We often talk about those who jump into this sector because they think it's the right thing to do. After all, Africa is known for emulation and leapfrogging, but we've gratefully left the point of innovating for innovation's sake just because that's what everybody else is doing, because so many of the best players in our industry have given us the ability to ask the right questions so that we can create the best solutions for the challenges that we see. But in building these, we need to be sure that we don't create additional forms of digital poverty all the way down to childhood or even at birth when the need for electronic IDs will start to become absolutely normal. And that's when FinTech and other attending solutions allow us to do cross border trade with each other, which means that banks will have to work with the, uh, the regulator for things such as interoperability, making sure that finance, cash, capital is tracked, it's traced, that exchange rates, liquidity, foreign exchange is all automated or easily understood. One of the things about Africa's context that I really have to push against, especially when speaking with VCs, is that not all solutions for Africa are purely digital. We still have analog and physical ecosystem challenges that we have to navigate. For example, in minding the gap and ensuring that the ecosystem can support economic growth, we have to make sure that laws and other legal considerations are interoperable with what policy is now, knowing full well that we have to support policymakers because they are often behind innovation. And until these two can line up a little better, we are always going to be doing two things at the same time within the African context of fintech development. And those two things are explaining and trying to get regulators to reduce that level of risk that they so naturally gravitate to and making sure that future policy is actually built in such a way that it engages and promotes growth versus limiting and protecting while they take time to understand what we're doing. And it is definitely, hey Google, stop. FinTech and technology, what are you gonna do? Anyway, as I was saying, it gives us an opportunity to design a future that connects us to the past. As traders, as merchants, as globally engaged, we can do that, but so much faster. We do that by ensuring that the velocity of capital is easily recorded and understood, that access and options are geared towards the real requirements of those that are driving GDP and the industries. And we make sure that the ecosystem itself can, make, can be sure that every African business owner or customer can decide and design a lifestyle that ensures that capital is accessible, it's accountable, it can be transferred, and that generational wealth becomes something that Africans are very comfortable talking about. For us, FinTech actually impacts every part of our existence. We are technical beings. We are financially adept. We have a lot of products we want to create, manufacture, sell, distribute. And we need to also make sure that when we go out there and say we're doing cross-border trade with each other, that it is done so correctly that we don't push ourselves backwards to reinvent the wheel because we missed out on the best elements of what fintech can deliver to us as human beings and as global citizens. 
Now, <clears throat> I promised myself I would not use all of my 10 minutes, but I really do look forward to answering questions for anybody who wants to understand how we use this to create a new narrative and why an industry that is worth maybe $5.2 trillion and how we as Africans can access, access that and be very responsible with the non-African partners that we choose to engage as we innovate and build growth. So I'm really excited to be here and to hear the rest of the conference and answer any questions. I hope that was okay. Wonderful, thank you so much, Viola. And I see some people are already starting to put questions in the Q&A. Um, some of the panelists are, are answering directly, but we'll also keep some of those for the Q&A session. So as you have questions, feel free to populate those in the Q&A and, and we'll address those during uh, that part of the presentation. Now, last but not least, uh, we've got uh, Kunle up to make his presentation. Oh, you're on mute, Kunle. You see my presentation? We did, and then it went away. Why don't you try sharing one more time? Okay. There okay. we go. Okay, you good? Yes, thank you. Okay, good, mo uh, good morning for me, good day for, for everyone else. Uh, my name is Kunle Lokoten and uh, I'm a professor at Stanford and also the chief technologist of Migo Money. And it's a pleasure to be here and uh, participate uh, in this panel. So thank you for inviting me. So I'm a core technology person. I've been doing technology for a long time. And so the focus of our approach to fintech was was technology driven, uh, and that's the way we we you know we we uh, went into a startup that was founded based on on some AI processing uh, technology that we developed uh, in my lab uh, about uh, you know six or seven years ago, and, and then of course you go into the market with technology, and then you're faced with the realities of actually doing business and doing business in in, in Nigeria and Africa. And of course, that kind of uh, changes your, your view of how far technology can take you. Uh, but so let me tell you a little bit about uh, you know, what we've developed at, at Migo. Uh, so you know, what, the whole goal was to try and, and, and uh, address the, this, this uh, access to credit gap that we have in, in developing countries, right? So, an estimate by McKinsey uh, in, uh, in Africa is uh, over $500 billion of uh, people who could, could, could small businesses and, and uh, consumers who could use credit to drive economic development. And so if you could provide this credit, then of course, as we've seen in, in more advanced countries, that can drive a huge amount of, of economic development. And so we th thought, well, you know, can we use technology uh, that we've developed to help this, this, this process. And so if you look at sort of what the situation is uh, in uh, Nigeria and other African countries, right, there's this huge number of barriers to actually uh, delivering credit. So, for, you know, the, the, the core uh, issue is, of course, is the ability to access the uh, to assess the credit risk of uh, the uh, consumers, right? So there's no formal uh, credit scoring models. There's no FICO system. You know, the limited amount of data that exists in the credit bureaus just focuses on the very top of the income pyramid and uh, doesn't really focus on, on the, the large number of people who could really uh, need the credit. And even if you look at Nigeria, which has a large uh, fraction of, of its uh, uh, Populous who's banked and then they've got a, a banking verification number, even this penetration is uh, not a, a, as great as you might hope. There's also a uh, limited appetite for uh, consumer credit risk when it comes to banking, right? So banks uh, in Nigeria, uh, you know, have uh, money that they'd like to, of course, lend, but they're lending it just again to the top of the income pyramid or they're using the money to buy treasury bills. And even though the, the government regulators would like them to lend more, uh, they have difficulty doing this. And you know, the, the governor's comments about the regulatory infrastructure are really important. And, and I think others have mentioned, you know, regulatory risks uh, affect what one can do. Uh, for example, uh, M-Pesa has been tremendously successful 
in Kenya and, and around East Africa, uh, but it, it thrived because of the regulatory structure that allowed a uh, you know, government-backed telco Safaricom to push mobile money and make mobile money successful. Mobile money hasn't been nearly as successful in Nigeria because we have a different regulatory environment where the banks are very powerful. Uh, the banks have 50, 40 to 50% penetration in the economy. And uh, they saw the telcos, which were foreign owned, as, uh, as you know, entering in, as a being, have, incursing in, into their, uh, their, their uh, financial market. And so they weren't eager for this to happen. And the regulators, the, the central bank, basically, you know, didn't allow money, money, uh, uh, mobile money to take off. And then there's the consumer technology limitations. People have mentioned that, uh, you know, that there, there is this GSM network, but the smartphone penetration, at least in Nigeria, is only 10 to 20%. And so any technology that requires you to use a start smartphone uh, has limitations. And then lastly, there's this business and technology limitations associated with the fact that traditional financial uh, institutions don't have the uh, technology and human capital required to distribute service and consumer uh, service consumer credit at scale. And then, of course, the existing network isn't always reliable. So MIGO is basically focusing on, on removing these barriers to credit, right? So the core one, of course, is the ability to assess credit risk by using AI and machine learning techniques to analyze huge amounts of data from telcos and other uh, uh, business to consumer businesses to train these models that can assess uh, credit risk and make uh, instant lending decisions. And then for banks that have limited appetite for consumer credit risk, uh, initially, uh, you, know, you know, Migo had to kind of demonstrate that, that these uh, models actually work by lending their own money or guaranteeing the banks a, a fixed rate of return. And then of course, of course, we would make more return uh, you know, by, by directly lending to consumers. Uh, we already talked about the regulatory list, but one of the key ones was the fact that, you know, mobile money really didn't exist. And so in order to lend to consumers and be part of the financial system, we had to be a bank. So we had to actually go buy a bank and, you know, prove this out. And then you, you, we, 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 we stayed within the regulatory rails of course, banks give out loans and they participate in the financial system. And so uh, you could think of Migo then as being this link between large uh, businesses like telcos and, and the financial system. In terms of uh, the uh, consumer technology limitation, the key thing was to meet the consumers where they are, right? So many consumers had feature phones. And so the initial service was provided on USSD uh, which, of course, uh, uh, allowed uh, the large number of, of consumers with feature phones to use it, but it was also possible to access uh, the uh, credit service through uh, the web, through banks' particular apps, and even at ATMs. Of course, cash is, is still widely used in, in much of Africa, so you need some way of getting money. In towns, there are ATMs uh, further afield, then, of course, there's the issue of the agent network. And then lastly, the business technology limitations. And this is a place where Migo's uh, capability was to provide a service with simple APIs that could be integrated into businesses and banks uh, a, a technology uh, a, a platform and, and, and provide this capability for providing credit by uh, providing both the scoring, the decisioning, the servicing, and the collections. And so the kind of two key products that uh, Migo provides. First, origination, right? We provide scores and uh, we integrate with AppZone, which is one of the leading uh, providers of software solutions to fintechs uh, and microfinance banks in, in Nigeria. And you know, using the scoring uh, capability, we can get very accurate models for first time lenders and the lifetime revenue that, uh, from lenders. And we use all kinds of information, telco information, also uh, uh, data from uh, the macroeconomic uh, uh, world, such as uh, uh, economic indicators and, and currency fluctuations. And you know, the prediction rates are very high. And, and then uh, of course, we also do the servicing of, of loans. So we have different kinds of loan products, uh, 
uh, bullet one-time payment loans and then installment loans. And these can be uh, arranged to provide uh, 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 services, credit services, uh, credit uh, products to users in, in, in different uh, uh, ways, right? So you, you can provide direct cash loans uh, or you can provide uh, a data, you can provide uh, money payments uh, to merchants. <clears throat> and so Migo powers both of these and uh, the, the, these two different products provide a way of cash for the uh, uh, consumer to uh, use their, their data direct, uh, use the money directly uh, to do whatever they want or uh, money to be used as the purchase of goods. So credit at the point of sale. A key point I'd like to make uh, about you know, Migo's approach is really about partnerships, building partnerships between different businesses to provide uh, the consumer credit services uh, uh, th that we provide. So merchants, of course, uh, have the consumers and also uh, uh, the, the, the need for credit to drive their business, such as power or, or pharmacy or, or, me or medicine or, or all sorts of things that you might want to get uh, 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 services, food, uh, tickets, uh, what, what, what they like, telcos also have consumers, and uh, they've got the, uh, the the communication network and the ability to have data that can be used for making credit uh, in this decisions. The payment platforms are the rails that provide the financial uh, connectivity to move the money around, and of course, the banks that provide both the lending uh, capability uh, for uh, uh, for, and the money that, that drives the whole system. And so making partnerships between these uh, uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders means that everybody has to have a, a piece of the action, right? So you've got a complex deal structure and uh, to make everything work, people have to feel, uh, the, the different companies have to feel like uh, it's a worthwhile uh, activity. So the results have been uh, quite exciting, right? So we were, we were able to provide uh, uh, credit to uh, small businesses and consumers, uh, many more applicants, of course, than we uh, can, uh, can service because, of course, they're not all, uh, uh, don't provide the, the, the uh, credit worthiness that, that uh, uh, we would hope. But still, um, you know, over two plus million uh, borrowers, examples here from Fumilayo and Marcus on how uh, the availability of credit has really enabled them to improve their businesses. So lastly, uh, let me point out that, you know, I'm just a technologist. The key driver to uh, Migo is the CEO, Ikechi Nwaka. Uh, uh, other people who are important are the uh, data side, VP of data engineering, uh, Tevia, and the uh, managing director of Nigeria, Winston Osuchuku. Uh, we uh, have a global organization, the data science and, and executive uh, uh, is, is, is in San Francisco. Uh, we've got, of course, uh, uh, operations in, in, uh, in, in Nigeria and starting to ramp up uh, operations in Brazil. And then we do some back office uh, work in uh, Poland. So last, let me say that the key takeaways is, you know, Migo is really this embedded lending platform that enables companies to extend credit uh, to consumers and small businesses in their own apps. It's the partnership model. We're not coming over uh, the, uh, uh, you know, directly to uh, the consumer with an app uh, on a smartphone. Uh, we want to partner with people that this, uh, uh, you know, steers clear of the regulatory risks uh, of the banking environment and ensures that we've got uh, lots of people who uh, want to uh, participate and are, are excited about our success. And so, uh, key to uh, the whole approach is, of course, you know, sophisticated ML algorithms that assess credit risk using company data and then the ability to automate both the origination and the servicing of credit. So I'd be glad to answer questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm struck. Um, by the diversity of topics we've covered so far. And I see some uh, even more topics popping up in, in the Q&A. Um, and it's striking to me that although we've, we've talked about the diversity of the African context, right? And how Africa is not one place, 
Um, but still there are these themes that pers persist around Africa and indeed around the world when we talk about regulatory coordination, when we talk about access to credit, uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, things like that. So we're gonna dive more into that with the Q&A. Um, I encourage audience members to continue to put questions into the Q&A. We've got uh, just under 30 minutes to try and get to as many of those as possible. Um, we also have some other questions that came in previously for the panelists. So while we've got uh, maybe some more questions popping up in the Q&A, why don't I just start with some of the, the previous questions that we had and, and Governor, if it's okay, I'll start with you. Um, in the last decade, we, we saw the Central Bank of Kenya make a key decision to issue a letter of no opposition early in the development of, of M-PACE's mobile money system. And we've all talked about that quite a bit. Um, Given the central bank's role then, how do you view the role of the central bank uh, in the next decade as we think about balancing innovation and consumer protection? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic question. And uh, one of the things that uh, the central bank of Kenya did at the, at the time is actually to study the products that are coming to the market and also study the terrain in the market. Because essentially, M-Pesa was a product, everybody thought it was going to, it was just a transactions platform. But nobody saw it that it was actually going to be a very strong instrument of financial inclusion. Now, we have said we have covered quite a bit of space in terms of financial inclusion, and most of the African countries are joining in doing so many things in terms of the financial side. And that's where Central Bank Really, really, uh, we've seen. But look, look at, looking at it from the very end is to see what are the benefits. And I like uh, Professor Kunre actually mentioned why Nigeria, I've, I've visited Nigeria twice to talk about why we need uh, mobile phone financial services. And I can tell your answer is about the strength of the banks. And I had to fight with banks myself. If you look at it today in terms of how banks have managed to navigate and to use the, the that platform, electronic payments platform, or even or, or even M-Pesa, and even to actually uh, cover so much of the market, then you see that the future development is such that what do we really need in the future? One of them is that we are likely to have digital, just branchless banks because essentially it doesn't. You don't even need to to, to take a long trip to the bank these days. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that if we move away from the current conditions of the COVID, actually economic vibrancy can be driven by that kind of aspects. And this is where the central bank can move in that direction, trying to try and consolidate the gains. When I talked about the last 20 years, what we have seen in terms of fintechs and even the, the, the space and uh, financial inclusion since the introduction of M-Pesa, you can see that we are unlikely to go back where we were 14 years ago, as Nick reminded me, it's only 14 years ago that MPESA has been. And most countries are aspiring to be where we are. But what do they need to do? What was financial inclusion for? Yes, it means we need to move further and say, what about financial development? How about cut, cut, uh, you know, getting, getting to capturing all the markets? I think I made a, a comment that we have seen that fintechs are coming up with products products that are actually uh, sustainable business models that are cutting across all the sectors of the economy. So in a sense here, we are seeing that this is the tail that is going to wag the dog. And that is for us a developmental discourse that we cannot shy away from. And this is where I like most in terms of the future. We should encourage this, but let's not worry about uh, regulatory uh, problems because as, as, long, as long as you know exactly what is happening in the market, you can actually safeguard that. And the technology of regulatory sandbox is still live and very, very active. So I do believe that we can move mountains in terms of the development discourse of, the, of our countries. But and the final point is I talked about informal markets and look at Africa today, you'll find that there are two aspects of the markets. They are informal, but they are also segmented. And it's so difficult to navigate through different segments of the market. And all of a sudden, these electronic payments platforms, including e-government, has found us, or has found many countries, especially in the East African region, navigating across segments of the market. And for me, that is very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor. And Nick, you wanted to weigh in here as well. 
Yeah, please, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, just to build on what the governor said, I, I think if we look to the east, we've actually got some some interesting markets developments that, that we could look at and learn from. Um, there's the India stack, so called in, uh, in in India, and, and of course, you know, it's a it's you've got a much uh, more centralized uh, top down control system there across the whole of India. Even though India, of course, itself is also super fragmented, but but by putting the UPI in place, concentrating on digital identity, th these are really strong building blocks that I, that I think we'll, we'll need to see them emerge in, in Africa too and across Africa uh, to allow those next layers of services to, to be created. But I do think there's some lessons uh, from you know, other parts of the world that we, could, that we can look at that have worked well. Uh, and for me, uh, digital identity is going to be a really important feature of, of a scaled out system in the future. Can I say something here? Sure, please. Uh, yeah, so I think, think you know, I exactly agree with, with Nick that digital identity is a key, one of the key elements that we needed to solve in the Nigerian context was, you know, you, we already had uh, this bank verification number that was associated with everybody who used the banking system. Right. And what we needed to do was connect that with the mobile phone uh, identity. And then once you made that connection and you, you had the KYC information and you could check that out, then that became the, the way that you could authenticate uh, the users of the system. Right. And so you know, I think it's key. You know, you, there's, you've got to have some way of figuring out who people are and, 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 and uh, what their, uh, the, their uh, association with, with the financial system is. And so I completely agree with, with, with uh, what Nick had, had to say. All right. Well, we've got lots of questions popping up um, in the Q&A. One, I think Kunle and, and Nick um, would love to get your, your sense on. Um, one, this was, uh, was, was there any venture capital for Migo or for the other fintech uh, mobile tech providers? Was, that, was the VC, to the extent you were VC funded, um, sourced in Africa? If so, where, if not from where else? Um, and how many serial entrepreneurs can be found in Africa today? I guess let's let's think about this as like a, a broader question about VC in Africa and, and where you know VC funding comes from and, and maybe how we can look up, think about that ecosystem. Yeah, that's a really important question. Uh, you know, if you look at the the uh, number of entrepreneurs that have in 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 this whole digital fintech space, it's mushrooming, right? You know, go to Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria. There are lots of, of, um, of entrepreneurs who are doing interesting things. And I think there is a lack of uh, VC capital to, to, to fund a lot of these interesting ideas. I think that that's an area where we could uh, use more uh, investment. A lot of the investment is coming uh, from uh, the, the uh, from the U.S. and, and Europe, and uh, most of the uh, uh, people who get money for, from these uh, environments tend not to be African, right? Even though they, they may be moved doing doing business uh, in Africa. Now I'm an African who lives in the Valley, right? So I have I'm kind of in a unique position position, and so I was able to raise money both in uh, in the U.S. Uh, in uh, some of it from from uh, from Africa, from Nigeria, and some of it from the UK, right? And and so, uh, but but I'm a special case. Yeah. Nick, do you have thoughts here you yeah. want to add? Yeah. Uh, can I just say, Adrian, it would be remiss for us. Um, and Kunle, thank you. Your comments are very correct. Just like you, Cameroonian parents, born in London. I live in in Maryland. And raising capital for Obamba with my business partners, the VC space is very keen to do two things which I think don't fit, at least back then. First, they want to be able to quote unquote help Africans, but they want whatever is supposed to be disruptive to look like what they know. That does not always work when it comes to innovation for our continent. And it's one of the reasons why when we were raising capital, it was particularly difficult as a woman. It's not the same outcome for women raising capital for a tech company as it is for a male, even though, uh, similar to yourself, Kunle, um, I'm over here, I'm raising capital 
In fact, um, if you saw the Digital Undivided report, at one point in the United States alone, they only could find 13 black women to have ever raised VC capital for their own tech firms in excess of a million dollars. I was number 12. It gets harder and harder, strangely enough, the more innovative and adventurous you get at knowing how to encapsulate Africa's problems, when you sit down and speak to VCs who don't know the continent very well, they have a perspective that has to be disrupted. Thank goodness everybody on this panel and University of Michigan, you guys do a lot to chip away at that. But raising capital for African uh, startups and technology firms can sometimes come with strings that um, can subvert the purpose of innovation and your business outcomes. And sometimes it can be helpful. I think as African innovators, we're getting better at um, saying exactly what we mean and asking for what we want. So I just had to add that. Absolutely, it's a really important point. Thank you. Good. Yeah, good points. And um, I was just gonna put in a couple of data points which uh, the audience might be interested in. But we, we, we see uh, into the FinTech space around a billion dollars was raised in VC in 2019, so slightly old data, but a billion dollars, I mean, that's you know, it's starting to get sizable. And, and I know from my own experience, you know, we raised money into and COPA, of course, from a, a blend of organizations you know, dotted all over the world, to, to be honest. Um, but going back even further, M-PESA only started because we had a grant really from the UK government, which allowed us to experiment and discover the model before it it sort of got, got invested in heavily by, by Safaricom and, and Vodafone. But it's, yeah, it, it is, it's a hard job raising finance. I, I, I do think there's been a, um, a change in the last few years where there, there are organizations very focused on that blended finance where they, they want to see development that benefits general economic growth and you know, social uh, and, and even environmental benefits accruing for their investments. And that, there's a lot more of that type of impact investment money around these days and you know i i, I think it plays an important role especially in those very early stage ventures that, that we've been you know, we've been discussing a little bit today nick you make a very good point and i'm sorry if i'm jumping in ahead of anybody else when you think about how much capital is reported as to coming into vin, uh, fintech investments the numbers look great but there are so many gaps where that capital doesn't trickle down to other types of uh, fintech developers. But if there is ever going to be a change in the way in which we value uh, create uh, valuations for African fintech companies, I think they should take into account those that don't get access to as much money, but are still able to develop growth. And I think that there will come a point in the future where they will have a different way of measuring um, success metrics for African fintech developers and solution providers, especially those that don't have the benefit of extreme access to Silicon Valley or any of the, the London investors and VCs. And the more we see VC capital coming from the continent, VCs run by Africans, I think we'll start to see really great numbers as that picture fills in. Wonderful. And, and Governor, I'd love to continue with this theme. You, you talked a bit about regulatory sandboxes, but as we think about uh, access to venture capital, um, is there a role for the government that you see here as well? Yes, the, the, the bottom line is that if we allow ordinary behavior in the market, if you create appropriate incentives and even the rules of the game, then we are going to see the market developing. I've seen some comments coming in talking about digital reading in Kenya in the way. I think this last week there was a headline that 14 million Kenyans have been blacklisted by the, the CRBs. But what, what I, I actually said, are you surprised? I'm, I'm not surprised. Nick, you, I don't know whether you know, I talked about this one time because I argued that if you don't control the betting, online betting, and you also don't control the apps that are giving you, lending you money to go for online betting. It is going to be a mess. Anytime you have, you don't have appropriate regulations in the marketplace, obviously the market will develop in a very diverse way. Then it means that, no, let's say the Capital Markets Authority in Kenya was moving into developing and even coming up with fintechs and even regulating fintechs so that they can come up with venture capital firms that can be relied on. But obviously, 
the story is still going on on that side. But I think at the micro level, then everybody is now just getting quite confused in terms of how market conduct and regulatory uh, conduct is actually failing. You know, uh, the, the paper that Nick mentioned, I argued that if we are going to have the development that we really require is that we have to have a state capacity in this digital process. And one aspect of it is that you have to have very strong institutions that regulate, protect, and nudge the market towards the development areas. And that is where the venture capital is coming from, because it's going to be risky uh, if every, anything goes wrong. On the other hand, we also want to make sure that other, other regulators understand what is happening so that it's not really fast coordination, it's first of all to try and see that they have the capacity to understand where the market is going from. And that is the blueprint of what we really are looking for in terms of capacity, regulatory capability, regulatory capacity, and strong institutions to nudge the market in the desired path. And if need be, protect and regulate the market. You only protect when you feel that there are risks that cannot be surmounted. But protecting the market using the regulations that are there is very, very critical. Thank you. Um, I'd love to move, there's a, a somewhat related question um, in the chat about uh, technological capabilities in Africa. So, and, and servers, cybersecurity, technical developers, all these technical capabilities needing uh, advances in Africa. So I'd love to, to open it up to the panel here um, and say, A, do you grant the premise of that question uh, and to what extent? Um, and then B, what if, it, if we accept the premise of that question as, as true, what can be done to help make advances in cybersecurity developers, those things across the African continent? And I think, Viola, you had sort of marked this one potentially. Um, so why don't I start with you if that's okay? Yeah, um, I remember years ago, and I shouldn't be giving my age away, when the word interoperability drove every single conversation when there was a misalignment in the um, bandwidth on radios during 9-11-2001. That had to be resolved at both the state and the federal level here in the United States. Now, since then, and because of my background in disaster recovery as well, I have noticed that this is an area that has to be addressed, I think, through the lens of interoperability, again, because of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and because we have to be able to find um, a very rigorous blanket approach to begin with, um, as to how to protect data, individuals, cyber attacks, which often are from the outside, and even from an internal standpoint, I know that Ovamba creates technology that um, builds audit movie clips of every transaction that goes across our platform. The way in which to deal with some of these disruptions that Africa will eventually face has to be not just continental, but each country. But if each country is going to develop this, there needs to be some sort of a consortium that supports that interoperability to make sure that it's, it's has some sort of passportability across the entire continent, both at, uh, industri at separate industries, sectors, banking, everything. It's gonna be quite the tapestry. Um, I believe that the results and the best in practice for that, it's probably gonna come from both academia and from tech innovation. Somebody asked earlier about whether or not the African continent from a trade perspective will be taking its cues from Europe. My first glib response was about time Africa does it for themselves, does it necessarily need to emulate what Europe does? But there are some things that Europe has done that we do need to pay attention to, especially in post Brexit, especially as it, uh, um, how we measure what is successful and what we do about protecting the technology and the disruptions to markets and supporting the policymakers who I think are going to be wrestling with this for quite a while. So I don't want to take up time. It's a great subject. It could be an entire conference all on its own. It's just making sure that standards are applicable and make sense to the entire continent and each of those different zones, whether it's CIMAC or OHADA or, or uh, SADC, any of those, um, it's going to be complex. 
Yeah, and we've got about uh, eight minutes left, so I want to let's tick through um, some more of these and get to as many of these as we can. Kunle, there's a couple of questions in here for you, and I'll I'll try and combine them because I think thematically they're very similar. One, if you could talk about the efficacy of alternative credit scoring for for access to credit, and B, a, of course, address the question of bias uh, in alternative credit scoring and, and AI. Oh, you're on mute, Kunle. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the efficacy uh, is pretty good. I mean, I think if you look at what we're able to do with the combination of information, you know, you think about uh, you know, figuring out whether people are likely to pay you back, right? You know, once they've taken one loan and two loans, you think, well, you know, if you look at their, their, their uh, lending history, that is probably the best predictor. But the big question is, right, you're going to lose your, first, your most money on your first loan, right? Because now you you don't have any information about the the uh, consumer before uh, you, they take their first loan. And here, what you want, of course, is to rely on, on other alternative information that you have about their use of their cell phone, their top up behavior, and so on. And that can be highly predictive. And if and in fact, if you add that information to uh, their lending history. Uh, it's even more predictive than just the lending history alone. So uh, the point of, of, of the matter is that you can make very predictive models and ultimately these models have to be accurate enough that you can uh, make money because you know the initial default rate of the first loan is high. Uh, so yes, you, 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 you can uh, can predict and as to bias, uh, you, 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 the populations that you're looking at, uh, are, you know, you'd like to uh, uh, take the information at, at face value, you're looking at their uh, cell phone or financial behavior, and you're trying not to inject, you know, any unnecessary bias. I mean, that, the whole point of, of this is not, you know, no AI researcher, you know, develops models that are intentionally biased, right? You know, the data that they're that, that are driving those models might be be biased, and, and you like to root that out. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, you, you collect as much data as you can over uh, as wide a population as you can, given that, of course, the, the users are, are are willing to uh, allow you to to to, uh, uh, to use their data to, to build these models, and of course, that has to do with 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 regulatory uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, around the businesses that you're, you're, you're collecting data from. But once you have that data, you, you're trying to get a, as broad a population as possible and, and, uh, and, and limit bias. Kunle, I think this is why you were very smart in um, launching as a bank. We did the absolute opposite, but for similar reasons. That first risk with the first loan, when you don't have as much data, right? it's not like we're running around with three credit bureaus in all these countries on our continent. And that's one of the reasons why, and Laura, your question is brilliant. We chose not to look at these transactions or to look at finance from the, stand, from the standpoint of traditional credit risk models or even alternative. We look at risk in trade by putting inventory at the center of a decision for transaction, we removed the, the issues of non-repayability by using Sharia law to have physical and legal ownership of an asset as we service a customer with financial inclusion. And when we ran an extensive beta model in Central Africa, the one thing that was very interesting is the risk resurfaces, it's literally its ugly head, somewhere around about the fourth and fifth transaction with a customer. In our portfolio, we have customers who are on their ninth transaction. This is amazing data to collect. And the risk changes as the comfort level and confidence occurs. But when you remove the ability for that customer to actually physically have the money, especially when you're not a bank and you can't pursue this stuff in a court, you now have a really great way of managing business performance profit for that business, and you've got risk elements that can sit next to traditional credit scoring information, which is why partnering with these banks the way Migo has, and their alternative is simple APIs to get information. And then you take something like what Ovamba does with a SaaS-based um, trade 
product that runs end to end, we start to see ways in which to de-risk the entire continent, which should drive further investment. Wonderful. All right. So we're about three minutes left. Um, what I'd love to do is maybe turn to, to each of the panelists just to give us uh, 30 seconds of closing remarks, takeaways, things that you want the, the audience to take from this session. And maybe Nick, I'll start with you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, look, I've enjoyed it. Enjoyed the conversation. Um, uh, you know, some really big topics we touched on and, you know, we, we've not got enough time to do all of them justice, I think. But but for me, I, look, I am an optimist. I, you know, I, I you know, bear the scars of having sort of got two initiatives off the ground and they, you know, they are, you know, to, excuse my French, but they're bloody hard to make work at scale. And, and we shouldn't lose sight of that end consumer. Think about the problems we're solving for that consumer and use the technology to, to, to fix those problems. Don't get too carried away with the fabulous things that technology can do because it's, you know, it, it, it's all about solving a problem for someone on the ground. And, and you know, we, we try to keep that first in, in our mind as, as we're building new products and services uh, in, in East Africa. Thank you. And then Kunle, if I could go to you next. Sure, thank you a lot for, uh, you know, Invited uh, to be on the panel. It's been a you know very uh, dynamic and interesting uh, conversation. Uh, you know, I think you know the, the message uh, to the audience is you know Africa is an exciting place to do business in in the fintech space, and uh, the, there's lots going on. And 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 you know, no matter where you look, it's going to be a different uh, uh, a challenge. You know, whether South Africa, you know, West Africa, or East Africa. But the key thing is there's lots of talented young people, the, the, the large number of, 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 of uh, developers. Uh, I, you know, I lost count, you know, 700,000 developers across Africa who are interested in working in the space. So there's lots of talent. And what we need to do is to figure out how to harness that talent uh, to come up with, with uh, you know, African solutions uh, to African problems. Thank you. Thank you. And Governor. Love to hear any closing thoughts you have. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And let me make two points. And then in Africa, let me say, entry into a market is a very difficult concept. And uh, especially when it is coming with new products that are digital based or technologically based. For you to succeed, there's a lot of fear. And that's why I used to always to defend the first mover advantage should always be defended so that at least you know that it is going to move the market that's, that's for us is very, very important. And that's how the success in some of the companies, that some of the fintechs that have come in have succeeded because of that. Of course, I saw a question from the audience talking about digital capability and the system, cybersecurity and all that. And I, asked, I, I actually said, but we did present, several words are coming up whenever you mention fintechs. You talk about regulatory sandbox, you talk about innovation hubs, you talk about accelerators. What are we really trying to do? It is their experimentation so that those products are purified by the time they get into the market. And then they can talk about incremental uh, investment. Nick can talk about even how, even transactions, very, a number of transactions were even limited, especially in Kenya on Friday afternoon. And they went on and managed to create such a versatile system that they could handle all manner of transactions at different levels. So it's actually, it's an incremental thing. But the most important thing is that failing is a very serious curse. So if you succeed, then you can now continue with incremental investments that allows you to capture the market. And the moment you capture the market, then you're going to see more investments coming in with more facility and even extensive coverage and extensive uh, digital space that is going to work very well. That is my, my, my take because essentially we need to take small steps, perfect it, and then we can move to large scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Viola, please close us out. Thank you for that honor. And it is so good to be with everybody. I want to call everyone and be their friend. Um, it seems to me that the more we understand challenges and problems and successfully innovate for them, the more impact that we're making to the evolution of, of human beings. The more of an underpinning we have from the FinTech perspective, the better we will be as Africans doing global business and leading our own trajectory for growth. So it's exciting to see what we're doing and um, the fourth industrial revolution is here. 
and it's not televised, it's on an app. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you all to our panelists. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us very early in the day and late in the day for, for others. So thank you. And thank you so much to the audience and to the University of Michigan. Have a wonderful day.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel, Leveraging Food Security to Improve Population Health in Sub-Saharan Africa. My name is Du Bois Bowman, and I'm privileged to serve as Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us from literally around the world for this session. I'm really grateful uh, to be a part of the University of Michigan's Africa Week. One bright side of the challenges that we've all faced over the last year is that we have been more thoughtful about how to connect uh, in our global efforts. Last year, prior to the pandemic, I actually spent several weeks traveling across the continent of Africa with other University of Michigan uh, academics and leaders. And the trip was an exceptional opportunity for me to learn more about the partnerships that the University of Michigan has across Africa. Here at the School of Public Health, where I serve as Dean, our research and work spans the globe and we are in over 80 countries. And in fact, we have faculty working in 20 countries, even within Africa, including Kenya, Ethiopia, Ghana, South Africa, Botswana, just to name a few. The projects that our faculty lead range from childhood vaccination and cervical cancer in Ethiopia, to HIV prevention and treatment in Kenya, to nutrition interventions in Zimbabwe. Additionally, every summer we have scores of our Master of Public Health students who complete an eight to 10 week summer internship in collaboration with our African partners. This work would not be possible without the collaboration of many exceptional colleagues across the continent and I'm grateful that our school is able to work with some of them to advance public health. Our panel today is part of University of Michigan Africa Week. This event brings together thought leaders in higher education, industry, and government for a series of discussions on key issues and opportunities facing Africa in the coming decades. Each day of the event will focus on different themes. Today's themes cover economics and health we have four wonderful panelists joining us today to talk about the various facets of food security and food systems and their impact on population health across the continent. We'll also discuss how the current COVID-19 pandemic is impacting food security in Africa, as well as the effects of climate change on food security. I'd like to begin by introducing our esteemed panelists before we turn our, to our discussion portion. We do plan to allocate some time for questions from the audience, and I'll say a little bit more about this in just a moment, but now to, to introduce our, our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Adjua Coleman. Adjua's background is in chemical engineering, and she's held many positions at Dow Chemical Company. Currently, she serves as Dow's country manager for Ghana and the sustainability manager for the plastics business in Africa. During her time at Dow, her work has focused on sustainability for plastics and packing throughout its life cycle, including the role of packaging and preventing food waste and in moving goods safely. One of her recent projects is a program focused on diverting plastic water bags from landfills in Nigeria into recycling. Adjua, welcome. We're also joined by Dr. Christine Chege, who is an agri-nutrition and food systems specialist at the Alliance of Bioversity International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Christine focuses on understanding consumer behavior and influencing food environments to improve nutrition for consumers. Among many topics, her research has explored agricultural interventions for improved nutrition, influencing food systems for healthier diets and private sector engagement for improved nutrition. Welcome, Christine. Dr. Faru Lemma is a public health physician who has worked in various capacities in higher education, health service delivery and management, as well as research. He served as deputy head of a regional health bureau and assistant professor of nutrition at Jima University as well as Senior Research Fellow at London South Bank University. Since 2010, he has served as a Senior Nutrition Advisor at the Ministry of Health for Ethiopia 
And specifically between 2014 and 2018, he also served as an advisor to the former First Lady of Ethiopia. Uh, Faru, welcome. And finally, we have Dr. Andy Jones, who is an Associate Professor of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Andy's research examines the relationship between food systems, sustainability, and healthy diets. And his projects explore how agricultural biodiversity influences healthy diets and how food environments can be modified to nudge or steer consumers toward lower carbon food choices. Thanks to, so welcome Andy, and thanks to all of you for, for being here with us today. As you can tell, our panelists have a wide range of expertise and their work has focused on uh, topics broadly spanning uh, the, the continent of, of, of Africa and focusing specifically in some cases on, on various regions. And as there's significant diversity across the countries on the continent, as well as in many cases, even uh, significant diversity within individual countries themselves, we hope that some of this will be borne out throughout the discussion today. Audience members, again, please feel free to submit questions to our panelists at any time uh, throughout our discussion using the chat function of this webinar. I'll try to monitor the chat function throughout and we'll try to get to your questions as we go, uh, but we'll also plan to leave some time uh, at the end to, to, to return from questions uh, that, that come in. Uh, but again, if you if you have questions, please feel free to just submit any time and uh, I ask for your for your patience throughout uh, until we have time to get to, to them. Also, I would note that if you have a, a question that should be directed toward a particular panelist or even a particular subset of panelists, you can feel free to note that in your questions and I'll try to direct those questions uh, accordingly. So panelists, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you about your experiences, your research and work. So uh, we have a lot to cover, a lot to discuss. So uh, let's go ahead and, and, and dive in. The first place I'd like to start, you know, the, the, the picture that comes to mind, certainly for many Americans uh, uh, about Africa, I think is, is shaped in part by events that have played out over, over time, over history, things like famine or drought or conflict. And just to, to kind of level set and bring audience members up to date with the current view and a current picture, um, I'd like to probe you to share uh, your thoughts on the true state of food security across the continent. Uh, Christine, I'd like to kick things off by opening it up to you to, to hear your replies to this question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dubais, for this, um, uh, very interesting, these very interesting discussions. And yes, so like you mentioned, when people, most of the people hear about Africa, what comes to their mind is about farming and um, uh, conflicts. Um, unfortunately, that is mostly the picture that comes out and mainly it's driven by the uh, most of our media out there. So just first of all, before I get into the point of uh, food security situation, um, just to highlight that, yes, these are some of these actually are some of the challenges that are, we are experiencing in Africa and uh, the top three drivers of hunger and food security in Africa that we are recently in the last few years, five, 10 years that we are seeing are allow, around climate change, conflicts, economic slowdowns. So these are like the top three conflicts, um, I mean, the top three challenges. And um, by saying that, it doesn't mean every corner of Africa is fighting every corner of Africa's uh, conflicts or yes, but these are some of the challenges that we experience. And to mention a bit more on that is to say that um, in Africa also, there is very high potential in terms of what Africa can do and what Africa can achieve. Um, for example, we've seen a lot of statistics where Africa has been enlightened to have potential for becoming the global brand basket. Um, but then this can only happen if we are able to address some of our food insecurity challenges. For example, like we've mentioned, issue, issues to do with climate change, issues to do with um, post-harvest loss uh, and food waste, issues to do with um, uh, conflicts. Once we are able to address this, then we can say actually in Africa, we are in a position where we can be able to feed the world. 
Now, moving into the next point, uh, talking about the Africa um, food insecurity situation and how the food security looks like in Africa. So in the past years, we've seen some progression in terms of positive, moving towards a positive direction um, of food security. However, the figures are still very high. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see uh, food insecurity is as high as around 21%, 22% of the population not really able to achieve um, uh, a, a good diet, not even the diets alone, but really not able to achieve, to get food that they can consume in their households. And when you look beyond just Sub-Saharan Africa and you try to understand the situation by region, sub-regions, for example, within the East Africa region, Middle Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, we see uh, East Africa currently actually is leading uh, in terms of food insecurity. So we have as high as around 22% of the population in East Africa actually facing undernourishment, meaning that they have hunger. They're not able to get uh, food that they can consume, enough food to consume. So that said, when we look at the targets that we have for the SDG 2.1 for zero hunger, targeting zero hunger by 2030, actually we are not on track. We are way behind. There is progress, slightly, some slight improvements, but we are still much, much behind in terms of um, achieving that goal. Terrific. Back to you, Du Bois. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, very insightful comments. Um, I, I, you, you raised a couple of things I'd like to maybe return to later and, and probe in our question and discussion. But, but for now, I'd like to, to turn it over to Andy uh, to, to uh, receive your comments. Yeah, sure. No, I think everything Christine said is, is, is great. Um, I, um, I would maybe add a little bit to it, just saying that I think it's notable the, the recent trend we've seen Whereas in sort of the earlier parts of the 2010s, we saw some declining prevalence of undernourishment or food insecurity across the continent of Africa. It has increased in recent years, um, up from about 17.5% in 2014 to, to over 19% in 2019. Um, so that's, that's a troubling sort of change in the trend that we've seen. Um, I would, I would guess add a little bit of a context to, to this, just look, that might frame the broader conversation we're going to have. Um, Africa, uh, the continent, many countries on the continent depend on agriculture as a, as a large share of their gross domestic product, much higher proportion than we do in the United States, for example. So anywhere from agriculture accounts for anywhere from 20 to, to 50% of GDP in, in many countries. Um, it's a major source of employment. And I think that's a big distinction we need to think about when talking about um, drivers of food insecurity, but also solutions to food insecurity. Um, as a comparison in the United States, America's farms contribute just about 0.6% of GDP. So it's a, it's a very different kind of background context where we're looking at. Um, I would also say that uh, across much of the continent, it, it, it's a very young population um, across the entire continent, about 41% uh, is under 15 years and the further 19% is in the, the 15 to 24 year range. So that, that says a lot about um, where the labor force is at, where it will be, both potential and risks, I think. Um, and I guess I'd also say that food insecurity, at least in rural populations, it's, it's not as, um, uh, Ice con consolidated as we might think, it's sort of it's there's a lot of variation even within a single locality in terms of where we find food insecurity. Um, there's a lot of diversity, you know, within the same community or in the same region. So that that really brings about some challenges for how we think about targeting. Um, we it's hard to think about targeting just a, a few specific regions when, when we find food insecurity, um, especially in rural areas, really everywhere to some degree. Um, it also speaks to a lot of the variability that we find even within a region, let alone across the continent. So those are just a couple of comments I thought I'd make to sort of provide us a little bit of the context here for the larger conversation and where some of the, you know, where, where some of the, the, the trends are maybe originating from. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Adjua, would you like to add? Absolutely. Thank you, Dean Bowman. And uh, thank you to my previous panelists. I think a lot of the points have been covered. 
Um, and concerning this vision of Africa, I, I think I need to highlight that Africa definitely has its challenges, right? As do other continents, but I'd argue that we need to revisit how those challenges are portrayed um, and to bring focus more to the opportunities. Um, and so the African Union uh, basically um, um, states that 60% of the world's available arable land um, is in Africa and agriculture, uh, as uh, Andy rightly pointed out, accounts for a livelihood for almost 70% of the population across the region. So this almost changes the tone of the conversation we're having because it seems that when we're talking about food security in Africa, we may need to be talking about world food security because of the role that we play um, in the global systems. Um, and one of the key causes that um, is, is, is um, out there about the current state of food security on the continent um, is the fact that there's inadequate food production and also um, inadequate access to um, quality uh, food, right? And so in looking at this specific problem through the opportunity lens, um, I would ask, how do we enable more food production? And how do we enable better quality food production in Africa? And um, we can address this from what will be needed from the different stakeholders uh, who are involved in this uh, particular value chain across the region. And I'm sure that as we keep having these conversations, um, those specific opportunities will come out or be highlighted um, throughout our discussions. Absolutely. So, so I appreciate kind of ending on that note, uh, which is a, a, sh a shift in perspective. And there are there are clear challenges that uh, some of the panelists have alluded to, panel ch challenges that are real that you know have to be overcome. Uh, but on the flip side of that, enormous potential and opportunity. So, so, so I think that's a, a, a wonderful framing. We do have a question. Uh, coming in from the from the audience that I'd like to uh, ask somewhat related on the on the challenge side uh, and particularly you know related to you know to, to conflicts and and so it says can you speak about how the war um, in in Egeo in Ethiopia in particular the Tigray region is currently affecting the population and how the government is actually resisting aid from people re from from aid from reaching people. We hear a very concerning, severe, acute malnutrition, uh, much higher than 50% in some localities. Uh, to any panelists, I'd like to open that up. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Faru, is that something that, that you'd like to provide any kind of uh, uh, remark or response to? Thank you. I think uh, in terms of this was of general uh, food insecurity issue in terms of uh, Africa, but I think it became more specific from the first uh, discussion. But uh, the main thing is I think that these that there are quite uh, challenges as well as a lot of problems within in terms of uh, acute malnutrition, but also food security issues in Tigray and in other parts of Ethiopia, wherever there is a a conflict there is because that's one of the areas also Christine mentioned as one of the main challenges: uh, displacement, conflicts, and uh, affect uh, the food security situation. And there are uh, quite a lot of things happening. And now I think most of our partners are in, uh, led by the World Food Program and other development partners. That, and there are, I think, uh, at least supplies for at least two months there and uh, addressing issues there. Issue would be accessibility of the different areas where there is a need, but uh, actual services are being delivered. Uh, and also in terms of uh, linked health services and others, the Ministry of Health is working on using the existing facilities that have been destroyed to actually deliver services both in health and nutrition uh, in uh, the Northern part of Ethiopia over Right. So we'll, we'll proceed to the next uh, to the next question, which focuses really on uh, impacts 
that have been experienced due to the pandemic. And you know, food security in the United States, by some estimates, has doubled as a result of COVID-19. And I'd like to ask the, the, the panelists, what impact has the current pandemic had on food security in Africa generally or in you know, specific regions where you live or work? And in, in addition to uh, pre presenting uh, information just about these challenges, um, you know, if you can comment on new ways uh, that food insecurity might be addressed in light of these challenges. Um, uh, let's go. Let's go to Christine to uh, to address to begin addressing this question. Thank you. Thank you once more. Um, yes, for sure. The pandemic, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, came in really unexpectedly. Uh, no one expects pandemics, but this was like I would say a shocker, because um, when people are coming up. Things were getting on track, food security was getting better, nutrition, nutrition situation was improving, and then bab, everything kind of collapsed. So um, at the beginning, I remember when uh, the food security report, there was a report by FAO on the food security situation, food security and nutrition situation globally uh, came out last year. They actually immediately projected that because of the current pandemic, we are likely to have an increase in terms of food insecurity by as much as 83 to 132 million people, meaning an additional number of people who are, who are likely to be food insecure uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, and along the period of last year, several studies were coming out. We also did a lot of studies. We've done like three rounds of studies in the urban areas of Nairobi, trying to understand how does the food uh, security and broadly nutrition situation, how has it been affected by the pandemic? We also did standards, quite a number of standards in the rural areas and also with the distribu food distributors, really to understand how has the food system broadly been affected by this pandemic? And what is coming out, and also not just in our study only, but also in other studies in Ethiopia and other regions across the region, we find that uh, there are different effects uh, on different food system actors. For example, the urban consumers are hugely affected. Their food security may even be worse than double uh, or even triple. Like you would find some of the slum dwellers in the urban areas of Nairobi, you go there and people say they have not eaten for the last two days wow. or the child just had one meal. So it was really bad. And this is not, not just in one scenario, like in one household, but it was really a number of significant households in the urban areas. And this was again the case for the diets. You find what people are eating more is more of either cereals, their diets also significantly detroniated. Uh, and we, when we went down um, further to the value chain, trying to understand how has the distribution of foods been affected. Also, we found the food distributors were affected differently, depending on how, how strong was your relationship with the different actors before the pandemic. Uh, for example, when the, when, the, when the country was shut down, were you able to get your food produce from the farmers or were you able to supply your produce to the uh, consumers or not? And there are some, con some distributors who are also largely affected, meaning their incomes, their livelihoods have been affected as well. And of course, broadly, that also means people have lost jobs and definitely their food security has also been affected. Similar stories for producers. So uh, when we listen to all these stories, some of the few conclusions we came up with and what we also find not just in Kenya again, but also across um, several African countries is that actually what is mainly affecting or the effect we are seeing as a result of the pandemic may not be per se directly the effect of the pandemic, but it may be because of the uh, measures or the policies that have been put in place by the government to reduce the spread of the pandemic. For example, when the country was shut down, it means that there's no import, there's no export of food into or outside the country, therefore less food distribution. And therefore that's affect the consumption and the food security for the population. Same thing, restrictions uh, for in-country movement. That also affected food distribution across the country. Markets were shut down and many of the urban consumers, for example, wholly rely on urban markets for purchase of their food. That means their food security is largely affected because of that. 
Uh, and same thing again, we had restriction, like for example, social distancing in the market. That means people kind of fear really getting close to each other. People don't want to move around with food, even when you're told to do so. And that broadly also affected the food distribution and therefore food consumption for the population. I stop there. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Faru, would you like to, to add anything to that question? I think she took everything. Uh, the main thing I think I want to add is uh, besides setting the lockdowns uh, in Africa, the lockdown, the um, closure of borders and others, the timing, April, March, was the planting period in most African countries. So the overall agricultural production became uh, very difficult because of all the issues of uh, agriculture supplies and products being provided to farmers. And in, in addition to this, I think the existing work to support the agriculture production of the smallholder farmers, which are 65, 70% as uh, Adwa said, are, are farmers and most of them are vulnerable if they don't do that. But there are supports through the social protection kind of services that are being given. And uh, the production mainly is reduced, but they are trying to be, become clusters and do various activities to, to support one another. But I think the estimates which recently came out state that the overall production in Africa, agriculture production will reduce from three to 7% in, in 2020, which is coming out. But I think that will continue up to uh, this time. Uh, the other point was also Christine mentioned is imports. We import around uh, 40 million tons of cereals only cereals, 40 million for Africa. And that because of the a lot of border closures as well as importance being uh, uh, problems, there have been quite a challenge for African countries. But I think last year in April, April, May, the African ministers of agriculture met at uh, the African Union and uh, asked the political leaders of country leaders to focus on uh, two things. One is the social protection to cover as much as possible through the existing, because 2019 was a good production period as it was said by Christian earlier. And there needs to be support to those agriculture, but more of the farmers particularly are vulnerable and uh, a challenge so that they could start continuing the production uh, system uh, at, their, at their level. And also there needs to be, I think a programmatic change in terms of providing supplies, seeds, uh, fertilizers, as well as animal feeds so that they could uh, start continuing their work or enhance what they are doing in terms of the uh, agriculture production system to avoid food insecurity in Africa. Over. Great. Um, Adjua or Andy, would you like to, to add anything? We have we do have lots of other questions coming in, so happy to go on to, to something else as well. But if you have uh, you know kind of uh, thoughts that you'd like to contribute, love to hear them. And definitely, Dean Bowman. So I think keeping in line with um, focusing on the opportunity side of things, I'd like to highlight I think um, two ways uh, that this. Um, food security is being addressed um, 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 around the pandemic before, but more um, becoming more prominent during this pandemic period. So one of the ones which I think is also quite innovative is um, the reliance on crowdfunding um, platforms for providing finance to strengthen local agriculture. And I think this helps specifically address something that Faru mentioned, which is our reliance on imports, right? So access to finance for uh, making our local food systems better is one of the challenges. And so um, you're seeing um, crowdfunding platforms uh, cropping up specifically for agriculture um, in the region. One such example in Nigeria is a platform called Farm Crowdy, which allows um, anybody um, to make an investment into an agricultural business with very specific timelines for when to expect your uh, return on investments and what the impact of your funding will be. Um, and I think that that's uh, quite a powerful tool which um, really uh, received quite a lot of boost 
um, during this uh, pandemic period. Uh, the second thing I could also think of, and this is because I work specifically in this space, is around the renewed role of packaging in ensuring health and safety, right? So we've known that food packaging prevents food loss. However, owing to the issue of packaging ending up in the environment uh, post-use, um, more and more consumers were opting for unpackaged goods, um, which shifted over the, uh, um, over the pandemic period. So the importance of food packaging uh, for health and safety uh, really re-emerged, but also in parallel then helped um, to boost uh, that the impact of packaging on food loss uh, by increasing the shelf life of goods during this period where um, distribution systems were disrupted. Absolutely. Uh, terrific, thank you for, for adding that. Andy, I saw your hand go up. Did you have something to add as well? Yeah, I would just maybe be brief. This could come in later on too. Just to say that in terms of <clears throat> other, other ways that we can think about how COVID-19 might affect how we address food insecurity down the road, I, I think it's important to, I don't think anyone could have planned for a shock as severe as this or the, the steps that have been taken to actually shut down borders is extreme. And I, I doubt there are ways to prevent the negative impacts of that. But I think speaking to the idea of, of diversifying uh, uh, national portfolios in terms of um, how they depend on certain sources of revenues um, can be really important for this. And in Ethiopia, for example, agriculture accounts for more than 70% of its exports. So when you have a situation where you've shut down agricultural exports, that can really have a big impact, uh, a negative impact on the country. Um, so I think having a high dependence on either on cereal imports, as Fru mentioned, or exports of agriculture in a certain country can, can lead to, to challenges where you're not as res resilient to some of these shocks that occur um, and speaks to the need to sort of diversify some of, the, some of those, uh, those sources of revenue, I think. Um, not to say that we should become highly self-sufficient and that trade is bad, not at all. I think the opposite, I think we need to think about ways of finding ways of building and trade um, you know, in, more, in more resilient ways across, across the continent. Um, but also thinking about some of these potential shocks that could occur when you, there's no overdependence in a certain on a certain crop or in a certain region. Terrific. Thank you very much. So I'd like to turn now to a question from the audience, and the question is, what are the linkages between access to food and health outcomes in various countries on the continent that have emerged over the last decade and need to be critically addressed? So linking, you know, nutrition and food access. Uh, and availability to, to, to specific health outcomes. Um, anyone want to volunteer? And uh, Adjwa, I'm, I'm looking your direction on my screen, uh, hoping that, that, that you'll like to add comments here. No, thank you, Dean Bowman. And I think that this is one of the critical aspects um, of, of food security, right? And, and not even just um, quantity, but actually quality of food as it relates to nutrition as well. Um, and so I, you know, growing up, I was born in 1988, not to give away my age, um, but at the time um, in Ghana, there was a, a famine um, that, that was ongoing uh, from previous years and around that time. And I know of a number of children who were born during that uh, period who, because of uh, food scarcity issues, um, had some developmental challenges. Now, I'm not a health between child nutrition and um, um, their health uh, outcomes. So I don't know if any of my other panelists want to pick up um, where I left off. Um, if you have any specific information around um, you know, some trends in this particular space in the region um, and, and what you generally know about this topic. Thank you. Other, other comments? I can, I can make a comment, Dean Bowman here. Um, I think it's important to, <clears throat> going back to the first question you, you asked about sort of the, the picture that many of us have ar around food insecurity uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa or, or other regions of the, of the world um, where there, there might be frequent, you know, uh, 
<clears throat> droughts or other shocks like that, we often see very, you know, very thin, emaciated children who are, who are um, you know, suffering very, very severe acute hunger and malnutrition. While that is a very real um, phenomenon, what's far more common is the situation where children, uh, I, I think about children as a very vulnerable group, um, nutritionally speaking, are, are chronically malnourished um, when they're not, they're not consuming enough uh, micronutrients in their diet, vitamins, minerals. Um, they're not starving, but their, their overall diet quality, as Adjua mentioned, is quite poor. And that leads to longer term chronic deficits that contribute to poor growth of these kids and poor brain development, which has lifelong consequences for their ability to um, to go to school, to stay in school, to, um, to earn a living, to have enough income that leads them more vulnerable to um, chronic disease later in life. Um, so in many ways, the, the impacts of food insecurity are, are not as conspicuous as we might think from popular media. And they're much more insidious in the ways that they can actually have a, a lifelong impact on populations leading to poor health, but also to economic decline because you've got um, a population that is less able, less healthy, less able to work and to, to generate um, you know, wealth for the country, which has sort of a, 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 you know, this sort of vicious cycle that, that is attached to it. Um, so I think it's important to understand the various manifestations uh, of poor health that arise from food insecurity, not to mention, that's talking about physical health, but not to mention the mental health impacts. And, and there are some very real um, uh, linkages between food insecurity and poor mental health, uh, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but across the, the globe. And that's a very, in many ways, understudied, under-examined phenomenon that we, that is, it's, it's quite prevalent. Terrific. Thanks. We have, a, a, again, a lot of activity in the Q&A. So I appreciate all of the participants uh, submitting questions, and we'll, again, try to get to as many of them as we can. The next question is a specific one. Uh, and it's uh, directed to, to Faru. Um, so the, the question is, I wanted to listen to Dr. Faru Lemma on how the Ministry of Health can collaborate with universities in Ethiopia to mitigate the post-harvest losses and nutrition enhancement, equal distribution by adopting digital policy uh, uh, framework drafted by the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Any, any comment uh, from, from you to that uh, question and inquiry, Farouk? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I think uh, that's what you have said. I think we have the, the government of Ethiopia, be, in terms of the food system, as you just said, the food system, starting from farm to fork, but also talking about nutritious foods, uh, the production, as well as uh, uh, continuous supplies and sustainable uh, uh, consumption patterns, the climate, as well as what we can do in equity, women, children, as well as the climate. There have been uh, addressing, trying to address the food system kind of thing. And I think post-harvest, uh, in terms of dealing with that, uh, I'll give you a number. Post-harvest cost has been quite high in Ethiopia, been reducing, but in the last three, last, in the last three years, uh, uh, what was reported was we are losing around uh, a high amount of resources that could feed 17 million Ethiopians throughout the year, which is quite a large amount. So uh, harvest losses are quite high. And I think there are a lot of universities that do nutrition and agriculture together that are trying to identify various innovations and technologies to address the issue of post harvest loss. And I think uh, also, the other issue re related to the post harvest loss is the food safety, which is quite a problem in Ethiopia, particularly in terms of fruits and vegetables and animal source foods. Uh, because of access difficulties, uh, infrastructure for access for markets, uh, a lot of product, product produced foods are not uh, arriving at on time to the market. So, there is quite a lot of things to address across these. And, I think the Ministry of Agriculture and also within the Ministry of uh, the uh, Universities, particularly the there is an association post harvest loss alone that is led by a professor within Addis University, and this association is also looking at innovations and technologies that could help. And if there is any 
a partner in this meeting who wants to help and work with us to identify innovations or game changers to reduce the post harvest loss for safety issue. That will be quite interesting and important and we'll be happy to link with the Ministry of Agriculture. Over. Excellent. So the next the next question that we have received from the audience, um, and it seems it, it occurs to me as as much of a comment as a question, but I'll but I'll, I'll read it um, uh, directly. It says that I think that the African diaspora has a bigger role than is being suggested. A major problem is that the world and global institutions have not invested well in African agriculture technology for improving food security in Africa, managing climate change, et cetera. The African diaspora must be better mobilized to lobby in the US, Europe, Asia, and elsewhere to ensure Africa receives appropriate consideration. The US is looking out for the US, Europe is looking out for Europe. Um, it, it, again, it, it's a comment, a well-taken one, um, in, if any panelists have a reaction to that comment, would love to would love to hear your your response. Okay. If if there are no if there are no immediate takers, what I'd like to do is um, you know we've talked about the impact of of COVID. On, on food insecurity. Uh, another thing that has been less acute, less abrupt, but uh, you know, still emerging nonetheless is the issue of climate. And so I'd like to, it was referenced in the prior comment. And so I'd like to now just ask this, the, the, the question, given the warming climate, what preparations are being made for population migration due to degradation of previously arable land and subsequent changes in, in pressures on food supplies, food access, and associated social conflict? Uh, Andy, do you wanna, do you wanna begin uh, by providing remarks to this question? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I think there, there are some parallels between the, the impacts of the, the shock of the pandemic and the, and the shock that climate change is, is contributing um, to farmers worldwide, but especially throughout Africa. Um, obviously the, 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 the pandemic has been quite acute, whereas the climate change shocks are sort of chronic and ongoing. But I think there's a few things, I'll preface my comments by saying that, you know, African countries have the, the highest concentrations of poverty worldwide, but they also have the lowest carbon dioxide emissions um, globally. And so African countries are not the ones that are responsible for the, the warming climate that we've, that we've seen, but they are the ones that are being most strongly impacted by it, um, which is, uh, you know, there's an injustice there, a severe injustice to say the least, I think. Um, so it raises lots of challenges. Um, you know, going back to what we were discussed earlier, agriculture is, is enormously important for the continent. Um, it, you know, you know, more than half, up to 60 to 70% of the working age population in many African countries are engaged in agriculture. And agriculture is very, very vulnerable to climate change. Um, agriculture throughout um, Sub-Saharan Africa is mostly rain fed, which means it's not, these farmers are not depending on irrigation, they're depending on rainfall to, to allow their, for productivity. Um, so that means lower rain cycles or disrupted rainfall patterns can mean disrupted planting lower yields, falling household income. So it's a, it's a, real, it's a real challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of a backdrop for some larger issues that um, are at play on the continent with respect to productivity of agriculture. There's two real big constraints. One is the low land productivity. So throughout the continent, many of the, the soils that are being um, uh, farmed have been farmed continuously for many, many decades um, with very little opportunity for fallow to allow soil nutrients to regenerate or, and, and, you know, or for soil organic matter to be able to be, be managed or rebuilt. So that leaves a lot of challenges for the actual productivity of many of these soils. Um, at, at the same time, another very large constraint here is the issue of farm size. Um, as rural populations are growing, um, it's been driving fragmentation in land subdivisions so that the sizes of farms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. 
um, which makes it very challenging to um, for farmers to be profitable um, on, on these very small land sizes. There's some estimates that even if you were to, to, to double the, the farm gate prices of some crops, the land limitations would actually preclude households from achieving a, a, a suitable income for themselves. So those are two other constraints that climate change is just helping to exacerbate in terms of the, 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 um, the challenges that those are posing for farming households to, to earn a sufficient income. Um, You've also have, you have the issue of, of migration and um, most farmers who are vulnerable to climate change, they're not migrating to Europe. They're not migrating out of, out of um, the African region. They're typically not even migrating out of their country. They're migrating within the country. Um, and that place is, and, and they're often moving into cities. Um, and so a large share of these migrants are moving to urban centers that are already tend to be stressed in many, many ways. There's already a lot of, a large proportion of urban populations living in informal settlements, um, which is adding new pressures to these, these urban centers. And I, we can talk a little bit more about that, I think, when we talk about solutions and the ways that we think about how to address problems of food insecurity, but also the, you know, some of the, the drivers that are, that are exacerbating food insecurity concerns. But I'll, I'll pause there for now, just to note some of those trends. Terrific, and, and your comments uh, prompt an, another force uh, and uh, thoughts about another force at work, and it's related to a to a question um, that that I'll point to in a in a in a moment. But the the other force that I'm I'm thinking of is the the force of population growth, and currently Africa has the the, the fastest populate growing population in the world, and by some estimates, just over the next fifteen to 20 years, there's expected to be 50% population growth. And so these things interact with one another. Um, and, and so I will, um, before turning to other panelists in response to questions about climate, I'll now turn to another a, a related question and then, and then uh, open it up to hear your responses. So, so there's another question that we received from the audience Providing nutritious and environmentally sustainable food to all people at all times is one of the greatest challenges currently facing society globally. The problem is acute to Africa, where an estimated one in four people still lack adequate food to sustain an active and healthy life. What are some of the impacts of population growth and climate change on food security in sub-Saharan Africa? What are some key measures we can put in place to minimize this problem? Uh, so, 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 Andy, your your comments, I think, um, in, in part, apply to that question. Are there other panelists who'd like to to, to elaborate? Uh, and, and in addition to the to the climate specific portion, also the the issue of population growth. Yes, if if I may jump in there. Um... So looking at what's happening in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of population growth, and of course, um, like uh, uh, Andy already mentioned that because of the population growth and climate change, you find also there is migration, um, people are migrating, migrating to urban areas, and eventually this is also linking now to your question, this is definitely affecting the food security and nutrition situation for these people. Because when you find people moving to urban areas and they, urbanization in Africa is also uh, seen to, it's going to be among the highest um, uh, in the next few years. So that means the trends, if we are not very keen, then the trends in terms of our uh, food security, but also the nutrition security uh, is likely to be highly affected. So linking population growth and the nutrition situation, I think this is a big, big challenge. And of course, climate change comes in because climate change is also affecting the production it's affecting how much food, what kind of food we can produce, um, what kind of nutritious foods we can produce. And some of the latest uh, uh, projections by the climate system people shows that even the nutritious foods are actually highly affected by the climate change. That means there may be less and less production of these nutritious foods if nothing is done in the next few years. So still the challenge of nutrition will continue being there if we don't address it. And especially if we don't tackle some of these challenges that, that are coming in, especially on the climate change, on the growth, population growth, urbanization, and eventually linking to our nutrition situation. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone, Andy? 
Yeah, I just wanted to add in one other really important factor. There's been a couple of questions about the sort of links between food security and health. And it's really important to note that dietary risks uh, are the number one risk factor globally for death and disability. So poor diets, they pose a greater risk to health than alcohol, drugs, tobacco, unsafe sex combined. Um, so we know that diet quality is a huge, huge issue for, for population health. Um, and you know, this is true in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's true globally. Um, and one of the challenges that we, we need to meet uh, both on the continent of Africa, but globally as well is, is collecting data about what we eat. We may think that that's something that we know, you know, what everyone globally is eating, but there's really no systematic data collection uh, initiative for collecting dietary data globally on what, on what populations are eating. So we, we lack information about diet trends that can inform policy. There are data sources out there. Um, there's the Global Burden of Disease Study, which tries to aggregate different kinds of diet data or food availability data. The Global Dietary Database is another source of information on this. But what they're doing is pulling together data from disparate sources uh, based on what's available um, and it's hard to sometimes bring those together in a coherent way that's, that's easily interpretable. So there are some efforts by the global or the Gallup World Pool, for example, that's trying to begin to collect data systematically globally across the, the, the world. But I just wanted to make this comment that we know diet quality is extremely important for health. Food insecurity in part shapes diet quality, but we don't know a lot about diet quality. We don't know a lot about what people are eating and how they're the quality of their diets. And we, we need more data about that to really inform policy um, as, we, as we go along here. Excellent. So we're, we're, um, we've received a few questions that kind of get to the point about investments and, um, and, and engaging key stakeholders. And so I'd like to pose a question. Um, what needs to be done differently going forward to ensure industry, governmental agencies, and NGOs all work together more effectively to address the issue of food insecurity in Africa and, and thinking about strengthening uh, food systems comprehensively. Uh, at least one of the questions was directed toward Adjua uh, throughout, through, from, from our participants. So, so Adjua, I would like to, to turn things over to you to, to kick things off. No, thank you, Dean Bowman. And I think this is very important, right, to think about all of the different stakeholders that are, are or should be involved in ensuring food security and how to, to bring those efforts together. Because I think based on the discussions we're having, um, it's very evident that um, a lot of the issues are quite fragmented. I saw a comment um, within the chat uh, where someone had mentioned, you know, um, how, how do we get all of these countries which are so different to come together and work together um, along this specific issue. And uh, prior to, to this conversation, I had seen that the African Union had actually committed um, to making 10% uh, of uh, their annual budgets available uh, um, in each country um, to addressing the conversations around food security. But I think that um, um, as is quite evident, um, this hasn't happened in the way that it should. Um, so from my perspective, I would say that a multi-sectorial body or organization specifically aimed at addressing food security um, holistically for Africa would be a good start. Um, and maybe I'm mistaken and something like this does exist, but I think it would help to bring all of the conversations and all of the different perspectives together, right? Um, what such a body would do would be um, to elevate uh, this particular conversation to a strategic level where each and every um, um, stakeholder within that food value chain can propose very tangible actions um, for how to address the issues in the different countries because it varies. Um, also from country to country, what the specific um, issues are. And um, government can table what needs to happen on the policy side for this. Um, industry can be present to rise to the challenge um, of what the private sector needs to do uh, to be able to, um, to boost uh, uh, the policies. 
end and end, but um, all of this needs to happen in tandem. And that alignment, I think, can be promoted by uh, creating an organization uh, directly um, targeting this issue cross cross sectorial, um, cross regional, uh, um, um, with very clear goals. Excellent, uh, Faru. Uh, would you like to add anything to Adjua's comments? I think uh, mostly said, but uh, in terms of I think the food system, as you said, there is a uh, great need of uh, systemic solutions, as you said, and there needs to be a strong commitment as well as resources, but also partnership, government and government sectors, civil society, private sector, UN agencies and all have to come together to operationalize a system or innovative system to help us come up with solutions that would address uh, the food and health and as well as nutrition uh, situations uh, which are happening globally, but also mainly in Africa. And I think if you remember, there are the five P's in, in the SDGs, which are the planet, partnership, uh, peace, population. And uh, so the five P's I think are, maybe Christina could help me, but the five P's are these, what need to be done within the food system that needs to change them. So, uh, these are the main areas that need to be focused on if we actually need to change with the partnership, commitments, resources, but also having the climate within what we are doing will be very important. Sorry for missing the five piece. <laughs> I think you got most of them covered. So um, great. So, so, so the next question, it, there's been some uh, discussion already uh, built in, but I'd like to, to now just ask specifically in response to one of the questions as it pertains to thinking forward about future strategies. So uh, it says every crisis exposes the systemic problems and the pitfalls of previous interventions to deal with perceived weaknesses and the production of and distribution to food. As we go forward, what have we learned from the COVID-19 crisis and how do we adjust future strategies? Uh, so again, in light of what has already been said, our, I'd love to get reactions to, 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 to that question. Uh, and you know, the question highlights, calls out the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but we can think about adjustments to future uh, and future strategies as it pertains to climate and other things as well. Christine? Yes, um, thank you. So. Again, when I was talking about the uh, pandemic, and again, like you're mentioning, this is not just specific to the pandemic, but we, it's really thinking broadly in terms of um, how prepared we can be in future for any kind of shocks. So when the pandemic came around beginning of last year, we saw really that was like a, a wake up call to many policymakers in several countries. And that's when uh, policymakers, uh, food system stakeholders, everybody was saying, we need to do something. We need to make our food system resilient. In future, for any kind of shocks, we need to be ready for this. And since then, I think many governments uh, in Africa, uh, but I believe it's the same also for other regions, many governments and policymakers have been coming together to try and see how can we make our food system more resilient? What are some of the, uh, prepared, how do we need to be prepared? What are some of the technologies we need to work on right away for us to be ready for such shocks in future? Just to highlight a few, and also, again, I mean, a research organization. So also this is also a discussion that has been going around in our organization, trying to say, what can we do from the side of research and development to make sure that our food systems are actually resilient in future? And some of the uh, things we've been doing and also with other partners and also with the government, is trying to look around uh, technologies, for example, the research and development, technologies coming from research and development. And these, for example, are issues to do uh, with breeding. How can we breed varieties that are resilient to uh, climate change, for instance? As much as we breed for uh, productivity, as much as we breed for uh, consumer preference, also looking keenly into what is more resilient. This has been there, but now it's coming out much more stronger uh, in the last year. 
uh, or the last few years. And again, trying to think around, um, I think it's uh, Andy who mentioned about um, uh, regeneration of soils, uh, making our soils more healthy. So what technologies can we look around to make sure that this is ready, this is really happening, even as we think of the climate change and the impacts of climate change. And again, this comes through the research and development technologies. Um, yeah, so being prepared in such as an aspect, and in, a, in such a perspective really uh, makes countries more prepared for these kind of shocks. Again, Ajoa mentioned about finance, agricultural finance, um, uh, uh, digitization of agriculture. These are the things we've been hearing more strongly in the last one year. Like now we need to have really digitization of agriculture so that in case of any shock and for any reason we have shut down or uh, shut down of countries or regions, then through digitization of agriculture, actually commodities can move from one point to another because now people have just been dying without food or really not having enough food to eat, yet there are people who have enough food. So when you are able to digitize agriculture and make sure that there is um, farmers getting the climate information that they need to get, farmers are getting production um, information in terms of what they produce and how they produce, then this makes us better prepared in future in case of such as a similar shock, whether it's coming from climate or from pandemics. Uh, thank you, over. Terrific. Andy? Yeah, I think the comments I wanted to make piggyback nicely on, on what Christine was saying, which I, I wholeheartedly agree with. I think this issue on resilience is very important. And just going back to a, a comment I made earlier, I think diversification is a very important strategy for building resilience. Um, I think on a, on a number of levels. One would be um, if we look at individual you know, farming households, we know, as I mentioned before, farming is an incredibly important part of most economies throughout the continent of Africa. And it will no doubt remain an important part of rural livelihoods. Um, you know, many households are, are spending, you know, half or more of their budget monthly on food. So um, it's, it, you know, it's a very, bringing in food to the household is, is, is critical for re reducing poverty in many cases as well. So we know that we need to find ways of, of allowing farmers to produce food for their own consumption in part. Um, finding better ways to do that, whether it's through, as Christine mentioned, finding you know crop varieties that are more resilient to, or tolerant to drought or other environmental stressors, um, helping to modernize equipment and technology. Um, I think these are all important aspects. Bringing in um, things like grain legumes, which can be intercropped to um, capture nitrogen from the atmosphere rather than needing to buy external fertilizers um, can, can help to build soil organic matter and help to make soils healthier, but at the same time, potentially diversify diets or, or add to the income of a household by selling those, those legumes. So I think diversifying crop portfolios can be very important and finding ways of allowing farmers to do that in a sustainable fashion is, is truly uh, a part of the solution here. But beyond that, when I say diversity, we also need to think about moving beyond farming. As I mentioned earlier, farm sizes are going down and down and down. There's, there's this division of land, which is making it very, very difficult for farming to be a viable livelihood strategy. So um, what has happened in other contexts is we've seen consolidation of smaller farms and, and folks moving out of farming entirely into other sectors of the economy. Um, I think that is going to have to happen to some extent um, throughout Africa to allow both agriculture to be more profitable, but to also to, to deal with the fact that we're going to have by 2050 over 350 million young people in Africa between the ages of 15 and 24 that are, that are looking for work. So you know, where is that work going to be found? Um, we know that in other places like in East Asia, it's been through through industry um, and manufacturing. But in Africa, there's actually been a trend towards deindustrialization. Um, as a share of global manufacturing um, today in Africa is actually smaller share than it was in 1980. And um, there's much more of a, a trend away from industrialization, more towards um, things like tourism, things like uh, agribusiness through horticulture, for example, fruit packing, cut flowers, things like that, or information communication management type type um, businesses or the service sector. So it's not clear that industry will necessarily fuel 
the structural change that we're going to need to see throughout the continent and maybe through some other sectors, but we know that building in opportunities both for urban employment, but also rural employment are gonna be critical for allowing farming to be more productive and for helping to, to strengthen you know, the economy across, across the continent. Um, so I think those are very, very important in diversifying into different sectors to allow all of them to thrive. I also think just as a final comment, it's gonna be very important that the public sector play a role um, to some extent here through social programs, so, social safety net programs that are, that are targeting the poor in particular. I think the, the productive safety net program in Ethiopia um, is a particularly good example of this. It was established in 2005. It provides cash or food payments um, against public works that build local infrastructure like roads, for example, or protect the environment. Um, so I think programs like that where the government does step in to provide some safety net, it could even be a universal basic income, are gonna be critical, um, if not just as a transition, but potentially longer term to allow some of this structural transformation to occur that we know needs to happen um, to allow for some of the broader, um, you know, reduction in poverty that's, that's really needed. So. Great. Uh, so th for the next question, I'd like to turn to one that um, is, is as follows. So keeping in mind the enormous diversity of contexts across Africa, what measures are being taken across the continent to ensure that if a sufficient food uh, supply is available, that the supply is free from potentially harmful environmental contaminants. Um, Adjua, I'd like to look to you uh, to kick things off there in response to that question. No, definitely. I think uh, there are two things that I can highlight here. Um, the first one being standards, right? So um, in every African um, country, um, there is a standards organization um, which sets the standards across the board uh, in multiple areas. But here I'm talking specifically about standards for food and food packaging, which I think are very, very important um, in ensuring that food supply is free from potentially harmful uh, contaminants. So for most African countries, uh, this standards organization ex essentially creates that, um, creates that specification for what should be considered um, um, as good food packaging, um, what meets the mark for food contact, um, and how specifically um, to grade uh, different types of produce uh, based on their quality. And so this is, I think, one of the ways in which we are ensuring this. The second one that I would highlight, and I think I touched on this um, in a previous uh, comment as well, is the key role um, of packaging. Here, So, for example, um, across West Africa, millions of people access clean drinking water through an application called the sachet water pouch. Now, for anyone who's never seen this in person, I try to describe it as take your plastic sandwich bag or your Ziploc bag um, and imagine that filled with clean drinking water and heat sealed at the end. This is a cheap and effective means of getting drinking water to millions of people where um, they currently may not have access to it. Um, in Kenya, there's a similar uh, packaging application also for dairy. Um, and so when you think about um, very specific applications like this on the market, um, which are directly targeted at ensuring that there are no uh, harmful environmental contaminants uh, for specific food areas, I think that these are, are two of the main ways in which uh, um, Africa is, is, is ensuring this. Excellent. Uh, Christine, would you like to add anything? Yes, yes. Um, nice input there, Ajoa. In addition to that, um, when we think about uh, what's really happening also in Africa in terms of making sure that the food, if we have adequate supply of food, um, making sure this food is not contaminated, I, I would like to highlight the role of, again, research and development. Uh, in the past years, we've seen a lot of research and development work, and we have seen a lot of technologies specifically targeting at food safety, for example. Food safety, that means that technologies that will be applied to make sure that the food that is coming from, the, from our farms is not contaminated, 
doesn't have aflatoxin or does not get contaminated during storage. To give examples, we have some like pick bugs uh, developed from the US, came to, uh, for example, in Africa, were uh, tested, and they have been hugely disseminated, and also they are being used a lot now by, the, by farmers and food distributors. So such kind of technologies also play a very good role. Another example um, is uh, the Aflasafe. Aflasafe is a natural solution for problems of aflatoxin. So it has recent, it, it's not actually very recent, but it's been disseminated across Africa now. I know in, in Kenya, a number of people are using Aflasafe. Aflasafe. It's also being used in Nigeria. It's being used, I think, in Tanzania. So again, these are technologies uh, or approaches that are being used um, to, to reduce contamination of our food in the food, along the food system. Again, another important point I would like to highlight is the role of policies. The AU has really been, African Union has been supporting uh, the African countries a lot in terms of food uh, safety and emphasizing on the role of food safety um, in our food system. So they, they always keep saying, if you have enough production or you have food that is nutritious, but it's contaminated, is as good as not being produced because you end up then disseminating that contaminated food to consumers who consume it and eventually they have negative, it has negative implication on their health. So AU has been uh, discussing with different African countries on a food safety index, and they are encouraging different countries, actually countries across the African region to adopt this index, which is like a minimum requirement. So it just prescribe, describes different, um, to different countries on what you need to do to make sure that your food, your food system is safe and making sure that you have the minimum requirements for food safety. And this is an ongoing process and I think once all the African countries are able to adopt this policy uh, for the food index, food safety index, there's going to be a big, big uh, move in terms of uh, food safety in Africa. Thank you, over. Absolutely. So, so we're closing uh, in on our time together and I'd like to uh, pose one last question uh, that, that kind of combines some things that I see coming through the chat. So, so the question is, are there promising solutions or technologies on the horizon that you believe can address sustainable food production challenges? And, and in addition, are there particular roles that you think academic institutions like the University of Michigan can play to address these issues? Um, let's, let's go with Adjua, uh, if you'd like to, to begin uh, providing some final remarks or thoughts on this question. Sure, so I'll take the first half of that question around promising solutions. I think one of the ones that's really piqued my interest in recent times um, is the use of um, cold rooms that are specifically powered uh, by renewable energy sources. Um, we talked about resiliency of food systems and as the world is shifting towards decarbonization, we need to ensure that the energy sources that are tied to ensuring our food systems um, come from renewable sources, right? So outside of um, ensuring or reducing um, post-harvest food losses by having cold room um, systems within the distribution chain, I think that it's also important that those technologies are also then pegged um, to renewable um, energy sources to ensure um, that we have a sustainability mindset even as we're, um, we're trying to leapfrog. Excellent. Uh, time for maybe one other response if, uh, if anyone would like to, to, to add. Christine? Yes. Yes. Some other, just to highlight quickly, a few other technologies I think uh, would be really promising in terms of uh, 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 addressing sustainable food production in Africa. Again, looking at the climate change issues. We have been talking a lot about climate smart agricultural technologies. Uh, I think these are these have huge potentials, and again, these are some of the things we mentioned earlier about looking at the soil health, how to re regenerate our soils, how to improve our farming practices, make it more uh, climate smart. I think that is, that would be very useful. A, a second point is on climate information services. When you think of how farmers are producing their crops, um, most most African farmers don't have information on what they need to produce and how and when. So providing these climate information services to our farmers 
really would be very useful and guide them towards uh, uh, sustainable production considering the climate change. Thinking about, again, food loss and waste. I think this would be very important because the more food loss and waste we have, it means also the more emissions uh, we are emitting into our, uh, we are having more emissions into our environment. And when you ask about what is what would be the role of uh, uh, academic institutions, I really see academic institutions like uh, uh, University of Michigan coming in within all these points I'm mentioning. It's an institution that can help us to design some of these technologies that we're talking about to reduce post harvest loss and food waste. It's a uh, an institution that can also help uh, African region to think around how to design uh, climate information services that can be disseminated to our farmers. And at the same time, also the issue that Ajoa mentioned um, on the cold systems and these systems being used by our farmers and by our food uh, system actors. I think I see a role for the universities there as well. Thank you, over. Thank you. What a wonderful way to bring things to a close. I'd like to first start by thanking our panelists, uh, Ajoa, Christine, Faru, Andy, for sharing your time with us and sharing your insights. I'd like to thank all of the participants for submitting some great questions uh, and your patience as I you know, managed to, to, to get through your questions. Uh, there's certainly a lot that has been presented today, very rich discussions. Um, I'm sort of intrigued to probe some of these leads further. Uh, and uh, so, so, so we'll look forward really to, to continuing the conversation through various ways. So a big thank you to everyone who tuned in. I hope you did find the panel uh, as engaging, as informative as I did. And I'm committed to you know, continuing the, the, the important conversation. Hopefully uh, that we can continue the next phase in person sometimes and in, in, in gathering someplace in Africa. So to offer some closing remarks for day one of the University of Michigan Africa Week, I'm delighted to introduce Matthew Countryman, uh, Chair of the Department of Afro-American and African Studies here at the University of Michigan. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Bowman, and, and thank you to the panelists um, in, in this session. Um, for such a, a multifaceted and insightful discussion of food systems issues uh, in, in Africa. It really builds on the work of, this, of the earlier sessions and, and leads us, I think, to some really great uh, and important conversations we'll be having over the, the remainder of, of Africa Week. Uh, it is truly an honor as chair of the Department of Afro-American and African Studies to be able to offer these uh, closing remarks today. I, I was really struck in the previous discussion about the uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the, the importance uh, given to um, reframing how we think about uh, Africa uh, and its, um, as we examine its challenges, I think this in many ways has been central to the mission of our department, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, since its founding in 1970. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary department committed to scholarship and teaching on Black and African descended communities across the globe. Uh, we have been um, uh, a, a site of vibrant scholarship on, on Africa, as I say, since our founding, uh, under uh, with the likes of professors, our leading professors from the, from our early years, like um, Professor Niyar Sudakasa and Professor Ali Mazrui. Mazru uh, we currently have a faculty of nearly 20 African studies scholars, social scientists, and humanities professors, uh, and a longstanding collaboration with the African Studies Center since its founding in 2008 under the leadership of one of our faculty members, Professor Kat Kelly Askew. Um, I wanted to just highlight that three of our central collaborations with the African Studies Center, uh, uh, I think because they speak to the spirit of the final question in the previous panel about the role that the higher education can play uh, in addressing um, the kinds of issues we've been discussing and we'll be discussing all week. Uh, we collaborate uh, with African Studies Center on the um, University of Michigan African Pre Presidential Scholars um, uh, program that brings uh, um, 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 faculty uh, from Africa, African institutions to U of M on an annual basis. Um, number, uh, always we have um, uh, members of that program uh, in our department collaborating with our, with our faculty members, and it's really a vital part of 
uh, our, our, our African um, uh, scholarship programs. Uh, we also collaborate with African Studies Center on our language programs. We have uh, um, both a Swahili, long-standing Swahili language training program at, uh, and a new one now in Yoruba. Uh, and we're really excited about those collaborations uh, and introducing um, 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 these languages to our undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and finally, we also work closely uh, with the African Studies Center on, in the, on the master's um, in international and regional studies programs, African studies specialization, I, again, taught here. Number, many of our faculty members teach, work as, teach classes in the program, work as advisors and the such. And so it's really a, a, a vital component of what we do to work with African Studies Center. And it's and therefore my great pleasure to celebrate um, the first day of Africa week and to look forward to its continued uh, vital discussion. So uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, and, and thanks again for um, joining us today in this first day of Africa Week.